Our first witnesses this week are Alan and Sarah. Yes, sir. Alan and Sarah, please. Stanley Burgess. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. The evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Please state your full name, Sarah and Lisa Adams, and repeat after me. I do solemnly. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm. Sincerely, truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Alan, you're married to Denise, whom you met when you were both teenagers. Yes. And you've got three children, Sarah, Laura, and Liam. Yeah. Sarah, who sits beside you today, is going to be giving evidence as well. Yeah. And Laura and Liam have also both provided witness statements to the inquiry, as has Denise. Yes. You have mild haemophilia A. Yeah. Can you tell us how that was diagnosed? That was diagnosed uh, when I was uh, little. Um, I had my tonsils out and I wouldn't stop bleeding. I required some blood transfusions. Um, and then I had a tooth out a little while after that, same thing happened. And then they put two and two together, sent me to Addenbrooke's, and um, yeah, I was diagnosed with uh, hemophilia. Um, and on the occasions after the diagnosis when you re required treatment, as far as you can recall, it was mostly cryoprecipitate that you received. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. You've got, um, you're unsure, I think, about whether in 1976, when you had a dental extraction, you received factor rate or cryoprecipitate? I thought it was factor eight, but it's in the notes, it's cryo, but um, that, that's a bit of a confusion there. Even on the UK CDHO, it says unsure. Yeah, and we'll, we'll look at those in a moment. Yeah. But you didn't, I think, as a mild haemophiliac, need treatment very often. Not every week or anything like that, no. So you and Denise got married and started a family. And your wife says in her statement that you lived a very normal life, you loved playing football, yeah. and you didn't let your haemophilia hold you back. No, not at all. And you set up in business as a painter and decorator. Yeah, had my own business and employed a couple of blokes, so yeah. Now, in December of 1982, you had a bleed to your left calf following a football injury. Yeah. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, as in the days when you had to present to casualty. You know, I wasn't on home treatment then. Um, I know it's a bleed, but believe it or not, they wouldn't uh, take it as a bleed. They said, no, nah, no, nah, you just uh, badly bruised it and, and strapped it up and sent me home. And I should have, looking back, I should have, you know, put my foot down, or my good foot down, and um, said, no, treat me. But in those days, you mm. took everything a doctor said, it, you know. Uh, but it got worse, it got bigger, um, went back again, but they still refused to, to treat it. They just give me some painkillers. Uh, in the end I, I had to go in hospital because it started to smell and it was all colours of the rainbow. Um, went in there for a few days and then mm. they needed the bed so they sent me back out again. Didn't send the ambulance to come and get me the following day so I was in agony by that time. Um, and they sent me to Adam Brooks because I couldn't stop the ble uh, bleeding in the end. So that's when they gave me the, the factor eight that we think infected me. Uh, and we'll look at one document. It should come up on the screen in front of you. Henry, it's 1122006, please. It's a letter dated the 17th of December 1982, and it's from uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital, Dr. Clark, a <coughs> registrar in the haematology department, to your GP. Mm. And it says this. Uh, this 24-year-old man, known to this department to have mild haemophilia, was admitted on the above date, 10th of December 82. It refers to your problems having begun five days previously, when you sustained a blow over the left tibia. 
Uh, initially treated with a compression bandage, but no specific anti-haemophiliac treatment was given. The calf subsequently began to swell. 48 hours after injury, he was given some cryoprecipitate. He was evidently given instructions to rest this limb, and it gradually began to improve, although on the day prior to admission, there had been some deterioration with further swelling of the affected calf. And that's the point at which he was sent to Addenbrooke's, yep. which was the local haemophilia unit. Uh, well, yes, it was, even though it was 50 miles away, but it was the local one. Local to you. Yeah. <laughs> and then it refers in the next paragraph, in the past, he's had factor eight cover for dental extractions in 1976. Yeah. And that's the one you're not clear whether that's right that's, or wrong. I thought, yeah, I thought I was given, because with cryo, you always knew you had cryo because it, it, it was cold, you know, and... and uh, but this particular time, it wasn't, and I'm oh, sure they said that was factor eight, but... Um, in some notes it says factor eight, in some notes it says cryo, so I, I, I've no idea. Really. And then it refers to an episode of left shoulder stiffness responding to cryoprecipitate two years later. That would have been 1978. There'd be no other problems. And then if we go down to the last paragraph on that page, it talks about um, you appearing well, but the most striking abnormality is the presence of an egg-sized lump overlying the mid-left tibia, and it refers to swelling of the muscles. And then if we go on to page three, please, Henry... Next page is is blank. So um, it's not very well copied, and this is the only copy you have, as I understand it, in your records. Um, so we, we lose the last bit of it. But we can see there reference to you being given enough factor eight concentrate to something, actual levels up to greater than 50% uh, percent for 48 yeah. hours. Yeah. Um, uh, and then it refers to you being gradually mobilised and uh, discharged and able to wait there on the affected limb without too much difficulty. So those are the circumstances in which you were given in December 1982 a factor eight yeah. uh, product, either for the first time or possibly for the second yeah. time if you'd had one in 1976. Were you, on this occasion or any previous occasion, given any information, warnings or advice about any risks of infection associated with no, the product? No, much well. Hey, <coughs> very shortly after you were given factor eight on this occasion you began to feel unwell what can you remember about that uh it was uh well i remember it was new year's eve that was um there was a party i couldn't go to it uh a neighbor's one because i was i had I was shivers you know shaking it's like flu really a uh, really bad dose of flu but felt worse um and yeah that that more or less i would have thought coincided with, with that bad dose that I had but I didn't realise that at the time just thought I'd caught a chill and it got worse and then between that date in December 1982 and 1985 yep. you had several treatments for small injuries but they were all with cryoprecipitate yep. yeah. and we have got individual treatment records but um, we'll just go in fact to the UK HCDO record it's 1122002 please Henry If we look at the bottom of the page, we can see for 1976 the entry yeah. is just error, yeah. hence you're yeah. not sure what you received then. Yeah. 1978 cryoprecipitate, then 1982, which is the occasion we've just been discussing, BPL factor 8, yeah. and then in the following years, 84 and 85, cryoprecipitate. Yeah. Yep. And you're not recorded as receiving factor 8 again until 1988. That's right. Now, in... 1985, <clears throat> probably August, September of 1985, you received a phone call yep. saying that you would have to be tested for the AIDS virus. Yep. What can you recall about that? Well, um, I was, <laughs> I, I knew about it. I was in a Panorama program, but I, I'd be honest with you, um, didn't, didn't think it affected uh, me because the Panorama program really... Uh, went to San Francisco, and obviously it was uh, gay men were presenting there, and didn't realise there was a problem, you know. And then they said, well, it could possibly, possibly be a small risk, you know, that um, uh, some of the factor you've had in the past might have been contaminated, but we don't think so because I th the reason they gave us you have you've had British products, um, but we're going to test you anyway. So went for a test, and. Oh, well, you know the rest, don't you? <laughs> well, I do, and yes. you do, and others will soon hear. 
you said in your statement you you put it to the back of your mind because yeah. when you received that phone call asking you to come for testing, you were essentially told it really wasn't likely no. to be anything to worry yeah, about. Right, yeah. It had been British products, and right. you yourself knew you'd received very little. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so um, you put it to the back of your mind, but then late in September of 1985. You received a letter. Yep. Now, we're going to look at the letter in a moment, but first of all, what can you remember about receiving that letter? Well, um, that was in the days when the postman called early, you know, uh, twice a day sometimes. Um, I, I was in bed about half past seven, uh, getting, you know, having a cup of tea, going to go up for work. Um, and Denise was uh, up with the kids <coughs> at that time, and um, she had the post, right, lovely. A uh, cup of tea there in this brown envelope, opened it up and told me I got the AIDS virus. And I, well, you know, um, I was, I thought, what, you know, it, it was, you, you had to go downstairs like normal in front of the kids and go to work and, um, but didn't really have a chance to even talk to my wife, you know, we just, uh, right, okay, and that was it. And we'll have a look at the letter. Yeah. You kept a copy of the letter. I did, luckily enough. Because it's n And you say luckily enough, yeah. why? Well, because it's not in my notes. <laughs> and it's 1122004. We can see it's from Ipswich Hospital Department of Haematology, dated the 25th of September 1985 from MS Edwards, consultant haematologist to you. It says this, Dear Mr Burgess, we have at last had the result of your test, and I'm extremely sorry to say that it has proved to be positive for the AIDS-associated virus. This obviously will be of some concern to you and your wife. I would like to suggest that if you give me a ring, we could arrange an appointment for you to come and talk to me and my colleague, Dr Philip Jones, about it and its implications, and to try and put your mind at rest. Yeah, there you go. You... Um, you are very critical in your statement of, of how this news was, was yeah. broken to you. You've described it as entirely thoughtless and inappropriate. Well, if the letter had gone to a neighbour, if it hadn't been delivered, uh, if it had gone missing, um, the connotation's horrific just to even think about it, because at the time, I mean, the stigma's still about now, but the stigma then was pretty awful. Um, you can only imagine what would have happened. Um, yeah, it, it, I thought it was shocking. But that was uh, indicative of the way we used to get treated, by, you know, uh, by, by the medical profession. To be fair. And, and can I ask you, what do you think would have been a right way or better way to, to inform you of, of the positive test result? To call us in, so they'd like to you know, meet you and your wife. It's important that you come in and an appointment and you come in and... Face to face, how it should be done, really. Um, common courtesy for a start. It, it's just, as I sh sh just thinking about it now, is shocking. <laughs> you know, the, the 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 shock never went away, really. Um, you went to Ipswich Hospital and saw the the doctor. Yeah. What's your recollection of of that meeting and what you were or were not told? I was poor, very very poor. Uh, in the advice, well, they didn't really give us any advice. Um, they told us to keep it quiet, um, best not to tell anybody. Um, but they <laughs> they didn't have a clue what was going to happen to me. Uh, they, they said all oh, the prognosis might not be good, but um, at the end of the day, we, we don't really know, and we went away uh, as confused, more confused probably than we went in, and that's why um, we weren't very happy. So I then went to see Dr. Seaman at Addenbrooke's, uh, because she was the, really, she, she was the head of uh, the East Anglian, you know, haemophilia unit. Um, but that was a massive mistake. Um, we walked in her office and she she was very angry with us. She, she wasn't uh, nice to us. She, she, she wasn't comforting or consoling. She, she said, what are you here for? She said, y you're wasting my time. You've wasted Dr. Edwards' time. She said, and you wasted your time being here. She said, you've had all the information from Dr. Edwards. She's phoned me up. And we're very angry that you, you know, and my wife was in tears, and uh, well, that was how we were treated. And just going back to the first meeting with the doctors in Ipswich, yeah. 
you've said in your statement that the transmission of the virus wasn't discussed with you and you weren't warned about the risk of unprotected sex or of considering further adding to your family. It was, like I said, there was no advice really at all. Um, there's one letter in your records which relates to that meeting, and we'll just look at that for the sake of yeah, completeness, yeah, Alan. Yeah, sure. It's 112007. Um, and we can see um, it's a letter, it's from um, Dr Edwards to your GP, dated the 3rd of October 1985. And it says this, with the recent publicity about AIDS, it has been recommended nationally that we should check all our haemophiliac patients for the AIDS-associated virus HDLV3. In accordance with this, we have tested Alan Burgess, having explained everything fully to him and doing it with his agreement. Pausing there, you accept, I think, the test was with your agreement yeah, yeah, in response to the phone call. Test, yeah. We had been hopeful that he would be negative because he's not had a great deal of commercial dried factor eight products. Unfortunately, the result has come back proving him to be HTLV3 positive and therefore a high-risk patient. This obviously has been of some concern to Mr Burgess and his wife. He's been informed, and Dr Philip Jones and I had a talk to him and his wife yesterday to try and explain things fully to him and to answer any of their questions. And then the letter continues saying the most important point, of course, that we put to him was the absolute confidentiality of this information, and I have stressed this at all points. And pausing there, that I think does reflect your recollection, Alan, that you were told you shouldn't tell that's anybody. Right. That's right, yep. yeah, that's, that's the information. The, the letter goes on to talk about what arrangements might be made within the hospital in terms of notifying people if you needed treatment. And then if we go to the next page, please, Henry. Um, we can see it talks about the second point um, raised, particularly was the problem of children, raised by, by your wife, was the problem of children and whether your wife herself um, was uh, infected. Yeah. Um, and I think it's right, and, and Denise has said this herself in her statement, Denise had to be tested. Yes. And you've described, I think in your evidence to Archer, the, the awfulness of the wait to find out yeah. the result, which thankfully was negative. Yeah, but she's also been mm. tested various times since, and every time is... Every time is awful, really, you know. It, it's, it's something that Denise didn't sign up for, and... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not nice. Um, but uh, you don't recall there being any discussion about, um, uh, in, in, any, in any detail, about risks to Denise or about planning future no, pregnancies? No, that, was, that came later, but not at that particular time. It's very poor. Um, you... Um, therefore went to Addenbrooke's Hospital, as you've described, to yeah. see Dr Seaman. Can I, can I just yes. before you, you do that, just go back to the first page of that letter. This is 007. Um, the, about six lines down, we'd been hopeful that he would be negative because he's not had a great deal of commercial dried factor eight products. Uh, from zero uh, zero two, the UK HCDO records he'd had none, had he? Um, uh, the 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 records suggest he'd had none, um, and Alan's only recollection is of the nineteen eight with any clarity is of December nineteen eighty two when the records suggest BPL, yep. but but so in fact there is an issue that Alan has or a concern Alan has about the accuracy of yeah. the UK HCDO records as a whole, um, and there is one further document in that regard. Perhaps we can deal with it now. Because certainly there seems to be some doubt in the, the mind of uh, the, the writer of this uh, as to what he'd had. Yes. Yes, and we don't know what that was based upon. Um, there is one <coughs> um, further UK HCDO database document, which is 1122018, please, Henry. Uh, and, Alan, you've um, flagged this to our attention. Can you explain the or point out the discrepancy which concerns you? Well, <coughs> it says date first positive on there, and it says 15th of January 1985. And um, <laughs> I was obviously had the test in, in August, I think it was that year, so I don't know how that can possibly be right. You know. And the sample date is given as the 15th of September 1985. Yeah. 
But as you say, date first positive, 15th of January 1985, yeah. you don't know whether that's a transcription error or whether there are tests of which you're not no, aware. I, I, that just doesn't make any sense. But, well, what does? But there you go. Uh, and, and so, um, and as I think we've already um, covered, but you don't know for certain one way or another whether you were given factor eight at any earlier point in 1976, yeah. and if so, what that factor eight might have been. Exactly, yeah. And the UK HCGA records don't tell no, us. No. But the, the chances of there being uh, the AIDS virus transmitted in 1976 um, seems vanishingly small. Uh, it, it does, but whether that was the basis for the statement in um, in the doctor's letter or not, we simply don't know. There's nothing else in the records that it provides any assistance in answering that. Thank you. Um, you've told us about meeting Dr. Seaman <laughs> at Addenbrooke. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I should say we, we have invited Dr. Seaman to respond to your criticisms, and if we receive a statement, that will be published on, on the website. Is there anything further you can recall about that encounter? No, just apart from the, the sheer horror of it, really. That he, she she wasn't <coughs> understanding. She, as I say, she wasn't. She didn't have any empathy for us. We don't want sympathy, but there, there was nothing. It, she was angry. She was angry because we were there, and we, I couldn't understand why. And and I say Denise ended up crying, and and I, well, it was a horrible, it was a nightmare experience. That's all I can say, really. And at that stage, were you or Denise offered any form of counselling or practical support no, or psychological no, support? None whatsoever. You um, said this in your evidence to the Archer inquiry, we were basically left on our own, a very bewildered couple. Yeah, that describes it well. Yeah. Now, um, within a few months of your diagnosis, Denise was pregnant. Yep. Uh, and um, what, what can you recall about going to doctors for any advice or assistance in relation to what you should do? Nobody nobody could give us any concrete advice. Um, obviously, uh, Denise was tested. She was negative, but they said that at the time that the test could take a while to come through, and, and if she was positive, there's a good chance the babe would have been and all this, and... Um, we had to think about whether abortion, you know, uh, but we, no, we didn't get any actual real advice. And so we ended up going to a GP in the end um, and saying, look, what do we do? And all he could say to us was, um, he said, I believe in God. He said, the uh, only thing I can tell you is you put it in God's hands. And that was the advice we were given. And we went ahead with the pregnancy. Luckily enough, everything turned out okay, you know, um, Denise wasn't infected, nor, nor was not. And, uh, but at the time, there, there was very, very little advice what to do. What can you recall about the, the circumstances of Denise's admission to hospital when she was um, giving birth? That was what should have been a happy time um, because of the hospital staff. It wasn't a happy time at all. Denise was put right at the bottom of the corridor in a room on her own. There was... She had, bio, even though she wasn't infected, she had bio, biohazard stickers and everything there. And the staff took me to one side and they said, do not, do not tell anybody up here what you've got because it will clear the ward out as quick as anything. It, 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 nobody will want to be up here. So it was almost, <coughs> it was done covertly and, and um, yeah, we, we were made to feel like lepers, basically. And... Um, yeah, that, that was how it was at the time. Denise remembers that, and, and uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't pleasant. What should have been a pleasant experience was not. Um, after Liam's birth, there were, I think, a few years when you remained reasonably well. Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. And you've said in your statement you tried to put your diagnosis to the back of your mind and yeah. get on with life. Yeah. You built up your business. Yeah. But you were very careful not to tell anyone yeah. of your diagnosis. Very careful. Because of the stigma yeah. attached to HIV and AIDS, which you were very well aware of from the media and TV. It was um, awful. Uh, mm. th there was a time <laughs> when didn't it, it wasn't, obviously, even if it had been, but there was no such thing as uh, paternity leave. And I, I was self employed, so I had to go straight back to work. But luckily enough, my neighbour um, 
that was rented out to uh, American personnel who used to work at a local base. Well, uh, they wanted me to paint the outside of the house, and I said, oh, okay, we'll do then, and I can keep popping back to see Denise and the babe. Yep. Anyway, we were out in the garden, and then we used to have the radio on me and the chap who was working for me. And at, at the time, there was a lot on, on, on the news, on the radio news, and uh, there was an age story. I, I forget somebody that died. It might have been Rock Hudson. I can't remember. But uh, <coughs> Denise was out in the garden. I think she was, I don't know, what you're doing, hanging, washing out with water. But anyway, he says, you know what I'd do with a bloody lot of me, so I put them all oh. against a wall, shoot that. And a lot of them. Uh, he said, oh, either that or put them on an island, dirty bastard. You know, and I thought, oh, no, oh, no. And, of course, De Denise heard she... She had a go. I couldn't have a go because I didn't want to draw attention to myself, you know. I, I, I thought, oh, he, he protests us too much type thing, you know. But that was the sort of attitude you got. And this is a chap who was working for me, you know. And I didn't realise he thought like that. And, yeah, that was why you, you, couldn't, you couldn't possibly come out with anything. Because can you imagine if I had, being a self-employed painter, nobody would have had me in the house. You know, nobody would have employed me. It, it, my business would have gone down the drain. Uh, straight away. So I had to, everything had to be kept quiet. Now you then started to feel the physical yeah. effects of your infection. You started to suffer from recurrent chest infections. Yes. Yeah. And uh, um, on, a, on at least one occasion, I think you had pneumonia. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, yeah. Very ill. Um, you, in 1991, you were involved in the HIV litigation. Yeah. We'll come back to to. to the settlement of that litigation at a later stage of your evidence, but you describe the, the mere fact of involvement as being very stressful and, again, something you couldn't talk to people about. No. Um, yeah, we you just had to keep it in the family, you know. It, 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 we, we had a family, obviously, the kids didn't know because they're too young to know then. I, um, uh, me and Denise had to keep it to ourselves, and, and it was... People, it was very difficult because people could see I was off work and back to work, off work, back to work. These are people in the close, you know. Really. And if it had been cancer or something like that, you could, you could talk about it, but you couldn't talk about this because the stigma was too much. So you had to keep everything. You couldn't talk about the court. Nothing. You couldn't discuss anything. Didn't even tell people I was a haemophilia. If we have up on screen, please, Henry, 1122008... This is a letter dated the 4th of July 1991 um, to a clinical psychologist. And we can see um, that it refers in the fourth paragraph to you having requested counselling and wishing to commence urgently. And it talks about there being a number of concerns, certainly the question of how his children are to be told and how to handle that is one matter which I think he needs to address. Uh, and then if we have up on screen, please, Henry... One one two two zero zero nine. We can see this is a letter back from consultant clinic, a chartered clinical psychologist, November of that year. It refers to him having met with you in July and seen you twice then on an outpatient basis, and then says this: each time we've met, he's wanted to unload the strong feelings that have built up. There are four people in his life who know of the HIV infection. He's generally reluctant to tell them when he's feeling downcast out of fear that it might worry them. The one friend he could talk to died last month from an AIDS-related problem, thus leaving him even more on his own. Alan appears to be a resilient person and one who draws strength from the love of his family. Nevertheless, he is facing stresses of major intensity and he does experience feelings of depression. And then it talks about the, tackling the issue related to telling your children. So... By the middle of 1991, things had come to such a head that you wanted counselling. Yes, I, I, I knew I needed... Um, me, I, it, it was, I think Denise is the one who pointed it out. You know, she said, you know, you, you need to speak to somebody and also my friend dying. Um, you know, we were, we were very close, even though he lived up in, in the North East, but we made each other at a haemophilia society do, but still in touch with his daughter now, strangely enough. And um, it was, yeah, that year, it, it was the, f 
yeah, it was tough. Um, and also getting ill as well myself. And even though I was back at work again, but when I visited him, or when we went up to visit him, his, his wife said, um, "You mustn't, <laughs> you mustn't tell him because." She phoned us up and said, look, Jeff's only got a couple of weeks. I've said he's got a couple of weeks. I said, OK. Um, and we, we went up there, but she said, you mustn't tell him that he's dying because he will. He'll just go ever so quickly. So you've got to make it. You was up here in the lakes and you've just popped in on the off chance. So we did. And that was awful. I couldn't say goodbye to him. I had to say, oh, I'll see you again, you know, come down over a bit of Suffolk. Yeah, that will do you the world of good. And, I know it was the last time I was going to see him. We were very close, as I said. And, um, yeah, <coughs> um, he did. He, he died um, a week or so later. And, um, yeah, I, I felt awful then because I could see myself laying. When I was visiting him, I, could, I, I thought, right, that's going to be me soon, I suppose, you know. And um, it, it was not nice. It was a horrible time. Um, yeah. So you took the initiative to ask for yeah. counselling. It hadn't yep. been suggested to you. Yeah. Um, I don't think the medical records tell us how long it lasts other than the documents we've looked at. Can you recall how many times you were able to see a counsellor at that stage? I saw him two or three times. Only because I used to come back and Denise would say, um, how did it go? And I said, well, crap, really. I, he, <laughs> He didn't have a clue, you see. He, I mean, he's probably very good in his field, but his field was not HIV AIDS um, or anything like that. And he, I felt worse after coming away from him because he'd, 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 he'd sort of sit there and go, oh, really? Did he, that's happened? And, and he, he was very, he was, uh, yeah, I, I felt as though he was offloading more to me <laughs> sometimes, you know. So that, that finished. And I saw a nurse who was... Because I used to go in every month for sandoglobulin uh, infusions, and uh, a nurse there was very interested in psychology. But I just saw her now and again. But apart from that, there, there was nothing. They didn't, you know, nothing. Uh, you'd refused to go on a trial of AZT in 1989. Yeah. But there came a point subsequently when you did start AZT. Yeah. H how was that? What side effects did you experience? Ooh. Uh, it was horrendous because um, I was trying to carry on work at the same time. Um, I it, it was I could it was I could hardly hold a paintbrush. You, you know, uh, it, your whole body was affected. It was um, it was a hor it was a horrible horrible thing to have. You had headaches. You had uh, a sickness. Um, it was it was horrible. And when I found. Uh, the doctor up who prescribed it, he said, well, yeah, that's normal. He said, that will that will pass. Keep with it. But it never did really pass. And I was, as I say, trying to work, but I was going to sleep in my dinner break. That's how bad I felt. And then you had to come home. You had to then go out and price job. It was, it, it was horrible because it just affected, affected the way you lived, the way you slept, you very fitfully, you know. It was, it was a horrible, but... You were told at the time, that's the only thing for you. If you don't take it, you're going to... Well, you'll probably die anyway. <laughs> but if you don't take it, you'll die quicker. So in the end, you, you take it because you've got a young family and, and you want to try and keep alive for them. But, um, yeah, not nice, not nice. By 1994, your health, your physical health was very poor. Yeah, yeah. You were advised to take a break from work, which, yeah. because you were self-employed running your own business, meant you, you no longer had any income. That's right, yeah. Um, I can remember... Because I, I had to let the chap go. Oh, no, no, I didn't, actually. Denise was taking him to work, weren't you? Because um, he couldn't drive. Uh, I was at home and couldn't even tell him what was the matter with me, you see. And uh, um, I couldn't pay the wages in the end, so we had to let, it, let him go. And you know, I couldn't go out and price a job, so the, the jobs dried up. And I remember Denise sitting in the garden one afternoon in tears because... We didn't know if we were going to be able to pay the mortgage, you know, and, and the bills uh, were piling up, and um, it was tough. It, it, it was a tough time. It was a very tough time. You got a motability car, but what happened to it? <sighs> well, um, because we lived in a little close, um, the rumours were circulating about me. I, d I didn't realise at the time until later that 
my children told me there was rumours at school and I was they said, oh, does he, is he a drug runner? Where's he, all his money coming from? You know, or it, it was... And they know it was a haemophilia. I don't know. We didn't know if people were putting two and two together or what was happening, but one or two people stopped talking to us. And um, we got the car, and within two days it had been vandalised. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, someone put a brick to it. So that had to go and be repaired, and then we come back, and the same thing happened again, and we reported that the police. The police took it so seriously, they put a camera in your bedroom, didn't they? A surveillance camera to... to uh, but the only thing that happened after that was the area was probably... The pictures were so bad, they couldn't see you done. So, uh, yeah. And you describe in your statement one occasion where you, you went away, you returned from holiday, and the window frames on your house had been vandalised. That's right. They had somebody had thrown... Um, well, I don't know, some... Something over them. I don't know whether it's acid or, 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 or f- I don't know. But um, and that's then I said, right, that's it. We've got to move. We're, we're going to have to move. And it took us a while to to find somewhere, but we did. We moved. And you said um, you didn't have the energy anymore to fight your illness and to continue working. No. Well, that was what I was told by the doctor. Um, they said, look. I was having reoccurring infections, uh, monthly really, and, and some of them were, were laying me low. And, and she said, look, you can't, your body's only got so much energy, you're gonna, you, you can't do both, you can't work and fight the virus, because you're going to be dead within six months. You, you, your prognosis is not good anyway, but you're going to have to stop, um, because your body can't physically do it, so I had to stop. And, Stop, I did. And there you go. And it was around this time, I think, that you made a will? Yeah, we, 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 we were told to um, put our affairs in order, yeah, go and make your will, which we did, and um, sort of like sit back, prepare to die, <laughs> basically. In April of 1995, you discovered that you'd been infected also with hepatitis C. That's right, yeah. How did you learn that information? Well, once again, um, I, I didn't even know I'd been... I, I didn't even know I'd been tested for a start. But what I used to do... I mean, in the early days, they, they used to try anything to try and improve your immune system, keep you alive. And one of the things that they'd done, they, I had to go in the hospital once a month for, for what was called sandoglobulin in, in, infusion. They give you about eight pints of sandoglobulin, and, and they thought it would boost your immune system. They, there wasn't any concrete medical evidence, but they thought it would help, and, and so I did. I went in every month for two or three years. We used to call it my petrol, didn't we? You know, you go in and be better. And uh, when I was in there, like I say, as an inpatient, you then had to, at the end of it, go and sit in the sister's office uh, to make the next month's appointment, you know, uh, make sure it was a bed. And um, I was sitting there, and, and my notes were on the table, you know, and there was elastic band around them, but underneath the elastic band was a, a little form from the lab, you know, uh, one of these lab forms, and I just looked at it, and I said, hepatitis C positive. And I thought, what? You know. Um, anyway, sister came in, and I said, "What's this?" She said, "Oh, you shouldn't have seen that." I said, "Obviously." <laughs> I said, "You know." Uh, she said, "I think she wants to talk to you about that." I said, "Yeah, I want to talk to her." And um, so I did. Um, uh, I saw was my hematologist, and I said, "Why didn't you tell me I've been?" Oh, she said, "But we, you know, you have a full blood count and things like this." I said, well, that doesn't cover it, not really. Um, and I said, me finding out like this? When, when? Oh, she said, I've told you, you know, you, you're quite resilient, you know, you know. And I said, I'm pretty bloody angry, you know. Um, I said, I found out, you know, I, I had AIDS uh, from a bloody letter. And, and now this, I said, can't you get anything? <laughs> yeah. And then she writes, luckily enough, because once again, the the... the, the Lab note, not in my notes, strange enough, but luckily enough, she... Well, this is what you're going to come on to next. It is. 1122012, please. 
And we can see this is an entry in your notes from the 13th of April of 1995. Um, and it says the hep C serology is back uh, and he is hep C AB positive. Unfortunately, he had seen the form on the front of his notes. Yeah. He says he feels all right about it as he has um, expected it to be positive anyway. Well, I, you take I, issue with that, I think. I couldn't expect it to be positive. I didn't know I'd been tested. So how could I expect, how, could, how possibly could I have known? And I was angry, really, because I thought at the time was okay. And, but looking back on my notes, because you never saw your notes in those days, you didn't know what was written about you. And that's, I hate to say it, but bullshit, basically. And, and a lot of it is. And, and a, what I've found with doctors is, is they'll write the notes to suit what they think, not the actual, um, you know, the facts of the, of the time. And that, uh, I was not all right with it, and I didn't even know I'd been tested. I mean, Denise would have known. I, that's, that's, you know, that's rubbish. So. And just for the sake of completeness, yeah. it continues, however, I apologised as I would like to have told him myself. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. <laughs> Apologise. A bit late, but there you go. <laughs> By 1996, so the following year, you were finding life very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, I'd gone on to some other drugs, um, antiretrovirals, uh, and they were just as bad as... The AZT, and I was every day was it was a yeah you felt you felt rotten every day really um, sickness and, and diarrhea was awful and and um, and I'm, I swear they they played with your mental health as well I think you know and you all, had uh, night terrors yeah I did I I had uh, terrible night terrors uh, Denise I used to have, yeah a hor horrible I think it might have been because I was on something called efferens at the time, and, and, and um, a lot of people have said that affected them that way, but I was on other, I think I was on a triple combination at the time. But the drugs are horrible, and I'd lost my business, obviously, and I'd become part of a group called the Birchgrove Group. Um, and that was a, a group set up by haemophiliacs, for haemophiliacs, because we found that we didn't have anywhere to go where, you know, uh, there wasn't any support group for us. There was for drug addicts, you know, for, for, for gay men, and <laughs> but not really for... So that, that was set up and I uh, became a member of that and that was fantastic, but it, it had a downside because um, you, <laughs> people used to say, well, you're a grown man, why do you hug each other at the end? Well, we didn't know if we were going to see each other again. We were dying at quite an alarming rate, really, and um, I did lose some friends and... Uh, and I had lost lost um, a couple of close friends then, and the drugs, and I just didn't see a future really, and, and I didn't like what I saw in the future, and I, yeah, I had a breakdown, basically. You said in your statement you were not a nice person to live with for no, your family. No, I, I, the daughter will tell you, and my wife will, I, because you take it out on your nearest and dearest, don't you? I, you know. Um, I wasn't, it wasn't their fault, but um, it, 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 life was horrible. It, it wasn't nice, and it just seemed to get worse, not better. Um, even though they put you on a new drug, you think, oh, well. But you just feel as though, it's almost like being on, it was like chemotherapy every day, you know, whereas chemotherapy, people have that for six months, and yes, the effects of chemo is horrible, but they know that there's going to be an end to it, but... With this, it didn't seem to ever, ever be an end, and it, yeah, it wasn't pleasant. And there came a point where you decided that you were going to kill yourself. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I used to go what I used to call walkabouts. Um, I'd take myself off. I wouldn't know where I'd been, and I thought, right, I'll, this is it. I'm, I'm going to do it. And I, they couldn't understand why I took a load of socks. That was because I'd read, if you you put the hose pipe in the exhaust and put it in, a, you've got to you've got to uh, make sure there's no gaps and everything. And that was that was what I was going to do. But um, I got out to the countryside and and uh, uh, I don't know really what stopped me. Um, I was thinking about it, and then my sister found me. Funny enough, um, they'd said you 
think the police were informed and all this because I was on drugs and you know and whatever. But it was my sister who eventually found me, and I didn't do it obviously because I'm here. But uh, I, I was then admitted into hospital. You were admitted to to St Clement's Psychiatric Hospital. Yeah. And and you described it as having had a complete physical and mental breakdown by that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it was a horrible period. It was um, not nice. And your wife talks about having an additional secret to keep because now she had to keep secret the fact that you were in the psychiatric yeah. hospital. Yeah, because obviously uh, then, I mean, uh, you, you can talk about mental health issues now uh, and, and people w will have empathy, but then it, it was just, uh, no, uh, that was definite. No, no, you couldn't talk about it then at all. Now you would... You stayed in hospital for some four to five weeks, I yeah. think. <coughs> After you were discharged, you saw a psychiatrist, but yeah. did, did that help? Did things improve? N no, no, not really. Uh, well, the, actually, they, they discharged me, and I didn't see anybody for a while. That was only because I had made my own arrangements to try and find somebody, and I found somebody in, in, in Norwich. But Norwich is... Uh, about 45 miles away, so as a 90 mile, uh, that was the nearest, and that was always down to me to try and do it. You know, there was no real help. So, but I recognised I needed the help, but it was almost impossible to find. If you get my drift, once you were let out of hospital, then that was it. Uh, they did think, well, you know, we've done our job on your on your way. So, now, and it was at this time that you and Denise separated. Yep, yep, it was, yeah. Um, could you pass this a yeah. tissue? Yeah, it was. Uh, what had happened was uh, I I was just as bad. I got bad again because the help wasn't there, really, and I was regressing again, and uh, I, I knew I knew I wasn't a good person to live with. I, I didn't even like myself, if you know what I mean, don't I? Uh, and we were rowing a lot in front of the kids, and uh, um, yeah, it, it was it was uh, a, d a tough time. So we we did we separated. Sarah, can I ask you before I ask you about your recollection of the time when your parents were separated? Can I ask you first of all about your recollection of how you were told and when you were told that your dad was HIV positive? Um, it was 1991. I was 11 years old. Um, I was helping Dad paint the kitchen ceiling, bizarrely, and I think something had been on the radio, and uh, we stopped what we were doing, and it was at that point I was told that um, he was HIV positive, that he'd been given some bad blood, um, and and we didn't we didn't know what was going to happen. We knew he was, you know, very poorly. Um, we'd seen him come home from work and disappear up to his bedroom. And we wouldn't see him for the rest of the evening as children. And, well, me at, at that age, oh, we always wondered why. And obviously that was then the explanation as, as to why he was so so ill. Um, of course, the first thing you, that goes through your mind at that age is, well, you know, Dad's going to die and he's going to die soon. But that's all you ever saw in the in the press and everything else was, yes, we, there were people out there with AIDS, but they would be dead before you knew it. And so that's naturally how... You know, we led our lives thinking that, you know, this was going to be it. Um, and you, you're the eldest. Yeah. You weren't able to talk to your siblings <coughs> because they were younger and didn't yet know. Absolutely. Um, and you were sworn to secrecy. Yeah, be because of um, the stigma <coughs> that was out there. Um, it was for our protection, really. I can understand why I was sworn to secrecy. Um, but, yeah, I wasn't allowed to tell a soul, so the only person or people I did have to speak to was either mum or dad and I didn't want to go and speak to, to dad so um, mum was obviously there for me at the time and count, you know sleepless nights and tears I mean I'm exceptionally close to my dad always have been and so um, yeah it was yeah it, it was awful when you were about 13 you asked your parents for permission to tell your best friend at school mm. so that you could have someone to talk to mm. What happened? Uh, Rumours started flying around, unfortunately. I mean, 
not blaming anybody, but that's what kids do. Um, it didn't take long before the, the wrong people in the school knew um, started casting their own opinions about how Dad may have become infected and, you know, where we were getting money from because not long after that we, um, we went on holiday, a holiday of a lifetime, to Florida, but yet Dad wasn't working and how on earth did we have this brand new car? How were we going on holiday? You know, he was known at school as the local <laughs> drug dealer. Um, and the car, in fact, was a motability vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> the holiday was paid for out of the money from the HIV litigation settlement. Indeed, indeed. But as children, they don't obviously see that. Um, it didn't take long before, um, you know, people would stop coming round. And um, and after this had happened as well, mum um, and dad being on, on benefits that they were, we were then entitled to free school meals. Well, at our school, you had to queue up separately for your meal ticket if you were on free school meals. So that in itself brought a huge amount of stigma as to, you know, why is, is this happening? So it was easier for us just not to get the free ticket and, and not to eat our meal. So we wouldn't eat during the day. It was just easier that way. Um, yeah, the taunting, the name calling, the bullying. Um, yeah, not pleasant. And you, um, your dad told you of his hepatitis C diagnosis about the time he found out himself. Pretty much as soon as, as he knew, he told us. And I know it sounds crazy, but when you're going through your mind or your dad's got AIDS, to then be told he's got hepatitis C, you're a bit like, and... You know, it was almost dealt with like a secondary illness, even though it's not. It's equally, you know, as important and, and sometimes can be worse. But no, it, we, didn't, we didn't see it as an equal. It was almost shrugged off in the family, really, as well. OK. Your dad's described the breakdown he had. Um, what can you recall about that time? Oh, it was awful. Um... So, like he said, mum and dad were rowing constantly, always fighting. Um, dad was like Jekyll and Hyde, you know, one minute you go into one room, it'd be as pleasant and joking, the next minute it'd be ripping your head off for putting the toilet roll around the wrong way. Think, little things like that. It was that intense at home. Um, he would go missing for, for hours, um, sometimes longer, and we wouldn't know where he was. Um, he just wasn't a very nice person, to be perfectly honest. And you've described in your statement um, pupils at school making AIDS jokes and jokes about psychiatric hospitals. Indeed, and yeah. You had to just put up with that. That's right. Our local um, psychiatric hospital was the, always the butt of jokes with kids. You know, you end up in St Clement's and this, that and the other. Well, that's where he was and had been. And so all you heard was the AIDS jokes, you know, the... It's not mental health isn't the way it is now. You know, it was a butt of all jokes back then. And so I'd just have to go along with it, really. It was easier that way than, than fighting what they were saying. And your parents then, as we've heard from your dad, separated for a period. Mm. Um, what was that like for you and your siblings? It was awful. I think I must have been about 19 or 20, I think, when, um, when they separated. Um, we were torn completely. Mum wanted us with her to, to look after us, of course, but in all honesty, this whole thing hadn't made her a nice person either. You know, Dad wanted us with him, um, but we couldn't do that either. Fortunately, the job I had at the time led me away, so um, I managed to escape a lot of it. Um, I was flying around, around the world, so that's what I did. I just, just didn't want to be at home. I couldn't be anywhere near either of them. They were, I'll be honest with you, they were both vile. And um, your sister um, and brother have both made statements, but your sister's made one that because she can't be here today, she would like to have yes. me read out about her experiences at this time. So I'm just going to do that. Um, this is from Laura, um, and it says this. I was 11 years old when my parents sat me down and told me, your dad's not well, he has something called HIV. As you can imagine, as an 11-year-old, I was petrified, confused and upset. I knew something wasn't right, as my dad was always ill, and he always went to bed after work, so we barely saw him. I'd seen the AIDS adverts on TV, and so had my friends at school, and they always joked about the gay plague. I couldn't tell anyone, sworn to secrecy. It made me feel isolated and alone. 
I even went to the extremes of not getting my ticket for a free school meal at lunchtime, so no one would ask me why I get them. It was easier not to eat than to have to lie. Eventually, my dad had to give up work because he became so ill. This then meant that any time my family had anything nice or went on any holidays, it would go around the school that my dad must be a drug dealer, as that was the only plausible explanation as to how he could afford things. This was humiliating and embarrassing. Home life was hard. My mum and dad argued a lot. My dad had developed a terrible temper to the point of even if he'd put the toilet roll on the way he didn't like it made him uncontrollably angry. Things got so tough that my dad had a nervous breakdown and this was horrific to watch. He was put in a mental hospital for a few weeks to recover. He has since had two other nervous breakdowns, one only just recently. When my dad got out, I remember, he used to disappear for days on end and no one would know where he was. It was terrifying. Every time my dad would get ill, we all used to worry that this was it. It was like living a roller coaster of emotions all the time. My dad's drugs to treat the HIV were highly toxic, so seeing him in so much pain and bedridden while his body got used to them tore me apart. Even if he did, did get used to them, there were never any guarantees that they would work as my dad had become immune to so many drugs. This was always a worry as we never knew if they'd eventually run out of options to treat my dad. As a teenager, living this nightmare was horrific. My family fell apart and eventually my parents separated, although they did reconcile a few years later. For me, my dad's illness has had a massive impact on my life. I have been basically robbed of any sort of normal life. It has had an effect on who I am as a person, one who struggles to deal with life's pressures. It has had an effect on all of my friendships and relationships. I have suffered with depression since the age of 14, seeing endless counsellors and taking a variety of different medications. At 19, I began taking drugs and self-harming, eventually leading to a suicide attempt where I was hospitalised. I just didn't want to be here anymore. I am still suffering from severe depression now and I have debilitating anxiety. I am under the NHS for my mental health and I am awaiting a psychologist's appointment which I've been waiting two years for. My mental health has again reached a very low critical point. I have never come to terms with my dad's illness in the way in which he contracted it, and it feels as though my family and I have been living a 30-plus year death sentence. The roller coaster that we have lived through with all the inquiries and promises has been heartbreaking, and I simply do not think our community can take another knock back. That's Laura. Mm -hmm. And... Alan, I think you didn't know the full extent of Laura's struggles until the Archer inquiry. <clears throat> uh, no, no. Um, uh, we were both uh, invited to uh, give evidence of that. Um, uh, and I, I gave mine, but Laura started to give hers, but she broke down and I had a close friend, Gareth, yeah. Gareth Lewis, um, he took over and he he he, he read um, Laura's statement for her, and then I was uh, I, I didn't know, but I didn't know just how bad it was, you know, regarding the suicide, and so yeah, that yeah that that that, that hit us um, hit me. I think my wife knew more, but she didn't tell me because she didn't want. We thought I had enough on my plate, really, but uh, it was a shock and. It's not, even though I was the one who got infected, it, it, it didn't just happen to me. It happened to the whole family, and it's still happening to the whole family. And and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I that's why I have sometimes these 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 feelings of guilt because it, you know it, it's me that is that's I'm the reason why you know the family's like they are, and 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 that's hard to you know, to, to come to terms with that sometimes. And, and um, I know what happened to me wasn't my fault, but you, you, you know, you, you know that um, it's not how a family should be, really. And it will never be right, but there you go. You and Denise were separated for three, three and a half yeah. years. But you'd stayed friends. Yeah, And you yeah. reconciled. Yeah, I got, I, I recognised... I recognise the problems in me again, and, and I did. That's when I got help, and I, I had an organisation in that helped me. I forget what they were called. Um, it was an AIDS organisation, and they told me this 
woman up in, in, in Norwich and, and uh, she helped and I went up there quite a few times and uh, she, I could feel, you know, the, 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 what she'd put in place for me was work and helping me and um, yeah, I, I think Denise could see the change in me and the kids and we did, we, we started courting again, you know, and we did, and then eventually um, we reconciled, which is nice. And we're still together, uh, just. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's been a rock, you know. She didn't sign up for this. Um, she didn't, yeah. It, it's, yeah, it, 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 we're back together, but the problems are still there. But that's how you deal with them, you know. <clears throat> now, although at this stage your mental health was improving, your physical health was declining. Yeah, yeah. Um, by January of 2002, you were resistant to the drugs that you were being given for HIV. Yeah, I was on what's, what was called salvage treatment then uh, at the Chelsea Westminster Hospital. Um, but I got so ill, uh, um, my viral load was, was, was off the chart, more or less, and, and uh, I'd got very, very, um, very few uh, cells, um, CD4. Um, and I remember I went into hospital because of Macaulay Ward there and Professor Gazard, who, who I was under, um, sat on the bed and he said, well, uh, we've got one more uh, set of drugs. And he said, oh, you're in the last chance saloon. He said, I hate that, put it that way, but this is the last chance for them. And um, luckily enough, well, it took a while. I was in there a few weeks, but um, they did. They, they luckily enough worked. But um, once again, the side effects weren't that great. But I was in the hospital to deal with them, so it wasn't quite so bad as being at home. And you have, over the years, suffered numerous significant physical health difficulties, either as a result of the infection directly or the treatment you yeah. received for it. Yeah. You've had mouth ulcers, Yeah. skin infections. Yeah, and uh, candida, you know, uh, throat and, um, yeah, uh, yeast infections and... All sorts, yeah, chest infections are worse, that seems to go to my chest. Um, You've had cardiovascular yeah. difficulties. Cardiovascular problems have um, been shown up. Um, bone thinning has shown up. Uh, sorry? Pancreas. Oh, yeah, pancreatitis was from the drugs. Um, kidney, I've had stage 3 kidney uh, disease because of the drugs and the HIV. Um, and yeah, so that's sad. And, and it's only... It's relatively recently that, again, you've had to change drugs yes. again because of the kidney That's right. I was on a drug called Trivana, and um, uh, my results uh, weren't very good kidney-wise. So um, it wasn't just me, actually. Quite a few hemophiliacs. I, it might be people in general, but we're taking off Trivada straight away because they realised it was damaging the kidneys. So we're... as because I'm under Professor Nelson now, but as I was explained to him, uh, by him, the trouble is we're, we're at the forefront. There's nobody in front of us, we, you know, because we're, we're the first generation, so to speak. You know, we, we, we're long-term survivors, and there's nobody else in front to, to gauge these drugs too. I mean, they, they're on the market pretty quick as it is, and sometimes you're on name patient basis only. Uh, um, but that, that is the problem. Um, so, yeah, who, who knows what's, what's in the pipeline next, really. What's going to affect us? You've, you've put it this way, Alan. HIV AIDS medication has played a massive role in my health over the years, both physically and psychologically, and will continue to do so because you are on medication for life. Yeah, um, that's it. You're, that's, you're on it for life, and you, you won't, you know, you, it's, unless they come up with a miracle cure, which I don't think they will, because too much money in the, in the drugs themselves. So <laughs> I doubt there'll be a cure. So um, yeah, that's. That's till I die. At some stage, you were told also of the risk of exposure to VCJD. Yeah. What can you recall about that? Um, that was um, my haematologist just said that um, in all probability, um, <laughs> one of the, the batches or whatever it was, um, uh, they, they recognised that this, there was a risk, but you're not going to get it. Um, because the only way that we can test you is if you're dead and, I don't know, the brain or the tonsils, yeah, but uh, you are at risk. We have to tell 
you have to tell uh, either dentists, um, and obviously they'll take note of that any future operations, which they do. I'm always last going in because I have to do a deep clean and whatever. You know. So yeah, uh, that was. But I didn't really take too much notice of that, to be honest, um, because as Sarah said, that's just something. You've just got to. You know, you, you've got enough on your plate. It doesn't, if it was on its own, then yes, you'd, you'd, you'd probably think, oh, you know. But it, because you've got so much else, it, it tends to get put to the back of your mind and you don't think about it too much until you do go in hospital. Then you realise you've got it because then oh, we've got to have special equipment and all this sort of thing. But that's why I was. You've not had any treatment for hepatitis C. I had a liver biopsy in... In the 90s, I can't remember uh, what year it was, but that showed that everything's fine. And the problem is with what I was explained, I could have gone on interferon and pe uh, what's it called, pepulated, uh, whatever. Anyway, um, they said the trouble is because of your HIV and because it's you know the drugs uh, go through the liver, sometimes it can upset your HIV, make it worse. So. If it's not broke, don't fix it, and that's the advice I've been given. So no, I've not had any treatment for that. Your statement says you do have some ongoing monitoring of your liver. What yeah, does that comprise? Yeah, yeah I, I, Dr. Um, Professor Nelson Dent at Chelsea and Westminster. I used to go to Addenbrooke's for it, but I, he said, "Look, um, I can do that here." He said, "Save your trip." So they look after me there. Um, so he he monitors everything and does me liver function tests and everything, so, yeah. Um, in terms of your physical health at the moment, Denise, in her statement, says you, you continue to get extremely tired. Yeah, that's fatigue, really. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not getting any younger anyway, but, um, yeah, it, it's it's fatigue. It's, it, it's come the afternoon, you, you, that's it. You know, I'm like an old man, really, sometimes. You, you know, you have to have a sleep and... Um, yeah, I do get fatigued uh, very quickly, very quickly. In terms of your mental health, you've told us about what happened and the events that led to your first inpatient admission. Yep. Um, but you've continued to struggle with your mental health. Yeah, I do. Um, I think I will, probably. Um, probably till, uh, till the day I die. But um, it, it, it's not helped by... Over the years, we've um, obviously you, you, you give up your job, you give up your livelihood and the, the, the business you've been building up and whatever. And to for man, you know, to 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 you know, it's not right. You feel emasculated, and and um, to have to rely on charity and and benefits. I mean, that's a daily thing, and you don't want that. All we've ever asked for is is, is financial dignity but we've never got that and um, that affects you and also because we were I mean we were lucky to get a mortgage but the only mortgage we could get because we couldn't get life insurance was uh, one that you had to you just pay the interest off each month and you had to pay the capital amount off at the end uh, well that meant that you had to save up for the capital amount but the trouble is when you're on benefits it then flags up once you go over certain savings. And I've had awful letters come that uh, say, right, you know, we, we, we're going to interview you under caution and all this, and uh, we, we think you're, you know, you're, you're guilty of fraud. And that, that's how it used to be in the, and, and when it first started off. And then we explained it, and we thought, right, lovely, they won't investigate us again. Because any money that came from the McFarlane Trust is, uh, was... Um, it was you didn't have to declare for for benefits or for tax purposes. That was one of the 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 things they put in place, which was good. But every every year or twice, three times a year, you get these letters saying, "Right, we're going to come visit you. We want to see all your bank books. We want to see this and the other." And you'd explain, you say, "Can't you just put a note in my file?" And they used to come round, Denise. Try sometimes because sometimes they'd be quite nice, sometimes they'd be horrible. I mean, when my son was living there, they went through his bank books and everything. And can you imagine the, how I felt? You know, asked my son, you know, um, anyway, 
and that was ongoing. And then eventually, because when I was self-employed, I'd, I'd, I'd put money in pension pots and everything, the law has changed now, you can get hold of your pension now. So when I was 60, I said, right, that's it, that money. We were going to use it for, I don't, I don't know, uh, uh, holidays and goodness knows what else, but I said, pay the mortgage off, I've had enough of this now. Every bloody year, you know, two, two or three times, I'll come in and investigate you. And lo and behold, you had done that, but this year, <laughs> twice within, in, within four months, uh, I, I get the first one that was DLA to PIP, so you have all these forms to fill in again, you have to get, um, you have to prove how ill you are still. Um, and then two months later, I get the other one, and, that, and that's for, um, and, and that's for care allowance and whatever, you, and you have to fill the same forms in again. That's another layer of your dignity stripped away from you. Every time you fill these bloody forms in, every time you had to write a letter to McFarlane Trust, you know, or whatever, uh, Ebus is now, you feel like you're begging, and that has an effect on an, an anybody, let alone a man, but a man you feel like you, sh you, 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 you should be providing for your family. You know, so it affected me mentally. I, I'm trying to say this is, this is ongoing, it, it, and I haven't heard back from... Um, the DLA thing, and funny enough, the other form I sent Saturday. But this is twice, and uh, you, you have to prove, I think, you, you buggers give this to me, and yet you're making me jump through hoops, you're making me prove how ill I am, how Ill, Ill you made me, you've made me. And it's almost like they get some perverse enjoyment out of doing it, and, and that's not stopped. We've been asking for years for this to stop, but to be passported or whatever, but no, it's not happened. And um, it, that's another thing that you have to deal with, you know. And you know, and I, f I don't know if there's a, a name for fear of brown envelopes, but I fear brown envelopes now, you know. I do, I, I fear them, you know. But there you go. And, and what you've described is one of the factors that precipitated a breakdown of some kind this year. Yeah, yeah, I, I did through family problems as well, to be honest. Um, these... Two investigations, assessments, whatever call you, you want to call them, and then obviously, I mean, it's great having the inquiry. Uh, it's brilliant. We've been calling for it for years, but I had to go through a lot of my old stuff because I did keep a lot of old stuff. Um, much to my wife's annoyance, she always thinks I clutter the place. But I, I went through everything, and that brings back memories. You know, friends that you lost, for things that happened to you, uh, and yeah. The, 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 and then all kind of, yeah, the, the perfect storm this year. And and then what happened was I, um, yeah, I, I, I did. I, I had a break. I knew, I knew I was heading for it, though, but um, when it happened, it, I, I thought, no, I've had enough now. Um, I really did. I, I said, that's it. I, I, I can't, I can't put up with life anymore. You know. Um, I'm just fed up with these bloody <laughs> intrusions in you. You just, just want to get on with your life as much as you can, but it's intrusion upon intrusion upon intrusion. And I, 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 I was, I was going to, yeah, I thought I, I'm, I'm going to, but this time I decided to do it, to do it in a slow, <laughs> slower way. I, I, um, I decided to stop taking all my meds, all my medication, and um, because I had a friend, a very close friend, he, he, he um, his first marriage failed because his, his wife couldn't deal with, with, with the AIDS aspect of it. Um, he thought he met his soulmate he had, but she died and he was devastated. So he, he decided to stop taking his medication and 18 months later he was dead. And I thought, right, that sounds good. I'll do that because the only person I'm hurting was myself. So I did and I stopped taking them for over a month, but I started to get ill. I, because my wife sorts out my drugs, she knew, but I said, I'm not going on them. I'm, I just, I've had enough, Denise. I, I just want to, you know. And, but in the end, I, I went, I was in a bad place when I, and, and, uh, I just had a complete breakdown, and they, Sarah, bless her, she, she lives in. She drove from, and I didn't know, and because I just, I was just, I was, uh, I was just a shell, really. I, I was um, crying, and it was horrible. Um, they took me up to the hospital, didn't you? And and 
I, I saw a psychiatrist up there and she admitted me and I uh, came out a couple of weeks ago. So here I am. But, you know, um, I'm, uh, in, I'm not recovered. I don't think you can ever recover, but um, I, I've got help this time and I'm putting things in place. And uh, yeah, but that's what this has done to me, you know. Um, this is, this is, anybody knows me, I think, oh, he's Jack Laird and everything, but that's tears of a clown type thing, you know. It, it's, uh, it's something that's affected me and the whole family, and I'm trying to deal with it better this time, though, and hopefully I will. Sarah, you were closely involved in relation to your dad's recent admission. Yeah. Um, is there anything further you'd like to say about that? Yeah. Um... <sighs> When um, when you you see your dad going downhill um, psychologically um, over a course of months, it's hard to take anyway. But then when you see him almost a, a shell of a man, um, saying he wants to to take his own life, you know he he, he told us how um, he'd prepared for it. Um, he t he knew exactly what he was going to do on the day he was going to mm. do it. Fortunately, there was something that he saw that stopped him. I saw. I was going to do it on this day that my wife had gone to. I couldn't go with her. I said I can't face anybody, and I thought right today is the day I'll do it. And uh, I was going to. I said I had all my drugs there, but I was closing down my laptop, and um, whether this is fate or not, I don't know. But as I was closing down the windows, um, it was a Facebook, and there's a picture of Sarah and, and, and Mark, Mark, my son-in-law, uh, their wedding. I thought, what, what, what on earth is that on there? And that was their wedding anniversary. And I thought, oh, I can't do that on a wedding anniversary. Uh, so obviously I did, because I, I, I seriously was. And so I didn't, and, and uh, there you go. But I, as I say, stopped taking the drugs anyway, so. And then, um, Sorry. That's, that's fine. Um, yeah, so obviously we learned about this, which um, breaks your heart anyway, of course. Um, just seeing rapidly decline quicker and quicker. And the, the drinking had become an issue as well because it was almost like a, a stick in plaster over the pain that he was going through. So he would drink and drink and drink and drink. And, um, and then um, he decided, like, Dad said about the um, the medication strike. So every time we would mention it, but well, I'm, not, I'm another cl day closer now. I'm another day closer. You know, and when we had to have him admitted um, that day, and I'd driven down, um, they didn't know I was coming because uh, unfortunately the doctor should have arrived at the, uh, Mum and Dad's house the day before to assess him, and the doctor had gone to the wrong address. Um, in, in hindsight, it's actually a good thing because I think had the doctor have gone to Dad's address, I'm not sure he would have been admitted on that very day. But fortunately, when I arrived, in Mum and I managed to get him an appointment to be seen that lunchtime. And, um, and the psychiatrist wanted him in there and then. Um, to take him up to the ward, um, it was so painful. To, the look of a three-year-old innocent child just looking at you with wanting and you know why are you leaving me here that that was how it was he was a child on that day I was the parent he was the child something I never ever want to do ever again that was one of the hardest days of, of my life having to do that to him he was on suicide watch in the hospital as well um, wasn't allowed any cables, leads, anything like that in his room. Um, and he was still adamant, even when in the hospital, I'm not taking my medication, I want to die, I have to die. He'd wake up angry every morning at the fact that he'd just woken up. He didn't want to be <coughs> here anymore. Um, fortunately, the, the care within the hospital was outstanding. Um, he's n not better. I don't think he'll ever be better. But with help, you know, we're going we're gonna to get you yeah, there. Yeah, we'll get there. Oh. We'll get there. 
Sarah, can I ask a little about the longer term effects um, of everything that we've heard from you and your dad mm. on you? Um, well, um, I'm currently um, signed off work at the moment um, through depression. Um, I'm on antidepressants myself. Um, you just have to be strong, but you don't. You can't always be. You know, seeing Dad go through what he goes through, it, it does have an impact on us all. Um, even goes as far as my children. Um, I've got a 13 year old daughter who's known for a couple of years now, and and she struggles a great deal with all of this. And because of the inquiry, I've just recently had to tell my 11 year old daughter as well something that. You don't want to sit down, you know, and, and tell you that your children that their beloved granddad has got what he's got and why he's got it. You know, I've got another son to have to deal with when that time comes too. Um, I worry constantly. Obviously, I live 130 miles away from mum and dad, so the the constant worry of can I get there on time if anything were to happen, you know, things like that really is. is I struggle. Alan, I wanted to ask you next, if I may, about some of the financial and employment effects of your infection and treatment. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to ask you more broadly about your involvement with the McFarlane Trust and the Haemophilia Society. Yeah. yeah. Um, as you told us, you had to give up your employment, yeah. your job. You had to move home. You could only then get the interest-only mortgage. Um, and you were involved in the HIV litigation in 1991. Yeah. Yeah. What can you recall about um, the way in which that ended? Well, it ended quite abruptly, really, uh, because um, we thought it was going to court. Uh, okay. Justice Ognall at the time was presiding over, over the case. And... Um, we were all ready for our day in court, really, and I wish we'd had it, to be honest. Um, we might not be here now, uh, because I think the facts would have come out and, and we'd have been in a better place. But um, Margaret Thatcher left and John Major came in, and the next thing you knew, they'd, um, I wouldn't say offered, they didn't offer the money. Uh, we were told the money was going to go to the final trust and then it's going to be distributed to um, to us but we'd all have to agree to have this money because it was in the days before social media so you didn't really know anybody else going through it, I certainly didn't so when you go and see your solicitor and the solicitor says yep um, good news, well they thought it was good news and I must admit at the time prognosis wasn't that good and you think well they offer you this money, you, you have to you have to accept it or nobody gets it. And also, there was one other <laughs> there was one other caveat that they put in place, and that was he had to sign the waiver, you know, and he, um, he wouldn't take the government to court on any blood, other blood-borne viruses in the future. I discussed it with Denise, and I thought, well, I ain't got long, that long anyway. And <laughs> I said, what, do you, is there anything in the house you need? I thought, I'll try and get the house in order before I do snuff it, so to speak, and um, I, I, I had an extension done, and I took the family away, and that was that, but um, we signed the waiver, and I didn't think any more of it, to be honest, but now I realised we were coerced into it, that was sort of like moral blackmail, really, and um, there you go. And at that time, you didn't know that you had been infected with hepatitis, no, no, because you only discovered that in the way you yeah. described in April of 95. Yeah. Um, were you also told that your legal aid would um, cease That's to be available it, yeah. if you didn't take the offer? Uh, yeah, we sat in the office and uh, they said if you if you refuse the offer because you're on legal aid, um, that, we'll, <laughs> that that will stop. You'll then have to fight the case on your on your. Well, of course, we couldn't do that. So we we like I say blackmailed into it. Really, you had to. You had no choice. Um, that was how it was put to me. I mean, solicitor's role in all this, I don't know, you know, what it was, but we, we, we didn't get the best advice, but not really at the time. In 1995, shortly after you learnt of your hepatitis C diagnosis, yeah. you wrote to your MP yeah. 
about what was then a campaign by the Haemophilia Society for those infected with hepatitis C. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll just look at the response, um, Alan. It's 1122011. This is the Department of Health's response to your MP. And you'll see it says this. It's stated the 19th of May, 1995. Thank you for your letter of the 1st of May to Virginia Bottomley, enclosing one from your constituent, Mr A. Burgess about the Haemophilia Society's campaign on behalf of those patients with haemophilia who've been infected with hepatitis C. I'm sorry to read that Mr Burgess has contracted the HIV and hepatitis C viruses. We have great sympathy with those patients who may have become infected with hepatitis C through blood transfusions or blood products. Most haemophilia patients were infected with hepatitis C before blood products were treated to destroy viruses. These patients received the best treatment available in the light of medical knowledge at the time. The health departments are considering a range of potential initiatives to improve the understanding, treatment and management of hepatitis C. This could include encouragement of research into the condition and guidance to the NHS on best practice where there is a clinical consensus. Uh, the government does not, however, accept that there has been negligence and we have no plans to make payments to such patients. And then the letter talks about... Um, not accepting the case for no-fault compensation. And then if we go to the next page, please, Henry. The letter continues as follows. It's the government's view that the most effective use of resources is to seek to improve the understanding, management and treatment of the condition. Only in this way can the impact of the disease on individual patients and their families be effectively minimised. This department supporting an initiative by the Haemophilia Society to undertake a study into the best way to support its members who are infected with the virus. And then the letter ends as follows. I hope that this will reassure you that the government will do all it can to care for those affected. It's a joke. <laughs> Absolute joke. But there you go. Everybody in this room knows it's a joke. But there you go. And that was the response that, that your letter got. Yeah. yeah. You've got to remember, I mean, I've been campaigning. First Prime Minister I wrote to was Thatcher. So, um, good few years. But this was just... Really, this is the sort of reply you always got, whether it's HIV, hepatitis C. They always thought that they'd done done everything for us and continue to do everything for you. And yeah, brilliant, the government, superb. You said in your statement that the monthly payments that you now receive from EIBSS in relation to hepatitis C is the first time you've ever been able to put any money aside. Yeah, yeah, the first time. First time ever, yeah, uh, but you're paying catch up, obviously, because you, you, you funds over the years um, have been so so poor, you know. But um, yeah, um, now it's yeah, I wouldn't say we're comfortable, but at the end of the day, it's a lot better than what it was under the Mac Trust. Although I haven't got any time for either this, don't get me wrong, but um, at least they've recognised now because even with them. You couldn't even claim, even though I had hepatitis C, you couldn't claim off the Caxton. You see, Caxton was set up just for mono-infected um, hepatitis C. So we, we couldn't claim, even though we had HIV we, and hepatitis C, we couldn't claim off them. So you, the fact you had hepatitis C was never really recognised by the government as such, apart from skipped and fun, but that was a one-off. You... Um explained in your statement that you fell ill on, on a holiday and had to pay medical bills of £220. Yeah. And when you sought reimbursement from EIBSS, what was the response? They said they don't pay for HIV and you pay for it times. So I said, what? But you're there. He said, if you, you could get it. You've got hepatitis stage one, but if you had stage two, you, you, we'd be able to pay. And the same thing <laughs> happened to me with... I asked for a funeral grant, I was told couldn't get it. So I, I just find the whole setup crazy because they've carried on what the McFarlane Trust done, but I think I may have got the money off the McFarlane Trust, but for some reason they, they're not recognising the fact that I'm co-infected, which is strange. Um, and what you said in your statement is that um, it's health-related costs for those who are HIV-infected. Yeah. Um, EIBS has told you they would not be meeting those. No, no they wouldn't. And you've suggested in your statement that um, it's part of what you regard as the suggestion that HIV should be downgraded because it's now considered a treatable illness. Yeah, well, that's, uh, as employed by the government to do that. I mean, they're, they're, 
they've peddled this myth. I mean, yes, it's fantastic. I mean, if, if you're diagnosed now, right, as awful as it sounds, but if you get in there quick, your, your, your immune system's not been damaged, um, and, you, and you go on the medication, you can have a reasonably um, normal life now. But people here, in here who, who are, you know, long-term survivors, the, the damage has been done to our bodies, you know, over the years. Uh, the, the immune system has been damaged, your kidneys, your, your cardiovascular problems, mental health problems. And yet the government want to band us all in together. So, oh, no problem now, HIV. Yeah. It's not a problem, you know. It's worse now having diabetes and things like that. Well, yeah, so it may be, as I said, for somebody newly diagnosed, but it's a whole raft of difference between somebody like the rugby player that was diagnosed the other week, the nurse, you know, and that's what we're now fighting to try and prove. You're even trying to prove it with the organisation that's set up to help you, <laughs> which is ridiculous, really. And you've already touched on the problems you've had with the DWP. Yeah. And as I understand it, it's the it's the repeated requests for um, to demonstrate that you are ill, yeah. to fill in further forms, yeah. to undergo yeah. further assessments. Get more hosp uh, doctor's notes. Uh, it's a waste of my doctor's time as well, having to keep bloody fill these forms in. But because um, he's as angry as I am, but what choice has he got? Um, I have to do it. That's it. That's what they make you do. You know, I mean, you've got to remember in, in the early days we were given this for life. They said, "Oh, you, you've got this for you know." We'll, we'll, but they only thought we were going to live three or four years, so they thought they're on a winner. But we lived a bit longer than they thought, so they thought, "I know we better change the goalpost now." And that's what they done, and now it's worse than ever. And as Mark, I mean, Mark gave evidence. He, when he sees a bearing envelope, and, and his partner, you know, it, it affects you. It, it it's. I don't know, I can't really explain it. After a while, it, it just gets to you and you think, oh, for God, you know. Uh, you just had enough. And I, I have had enough. <coughs> but what, 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 what um, choice have we got there? You talk about it in your statement as being humiliating and soul destroying. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And Denise has said this in her statement from her perspective. People affected by this scandal should be able to have their own money without having to feel like they're begging for it. I want reassurances that whatever money Alan is receiving will be guaranteed for the rest of his life without the need for constant checkups and assessments. We are constantly worried that they could change the money tomorrow and we will be left struggling. Yeah, that's because just because we get it from Ibis at the moment, that's under this government. Any, any future government can change that, a, a, a stroke. This is not guaranteed. I mean, we could... Well, it's like if I was to say to you or anybody in here that, that, that's got a job, right, you're, you're under permanent risk of redundancy. We, we don't know if you are going to be made redundant, but you're under the risk. I mean, how would, you wouldn't want to live your life like that, would you? Um, nobody would, and that is how you feel. You, you think, you know, it, it's just not right. It, it's almost like they've got the hold over you and they, and they don't want this hold to go. And, and so... Just financial dignity, that's all, all, all we ask for, really. Alan, can I turn to your involvement, first of all, with the McFarlane Trust? Yep. You were a um, trustee yeah. of the McFarlane Trust from about 2008, 2009. Yeah, yeah. You've described the McFarlane Trust in your second statement as being reactive rather than proactive and not making sufficient attempts to get more money from government. That's right, yeah. Uh, definitely right. In fact, um, they made no effort to get money from the government, really. One of the committees you sat on was the National Support Services Committee. Mm -hmm. What was that? the role of that committee? Well, any, any grant requests that came in each month were dealt with by this committee, and we that's why I became a trustee, to try and change their way of thinking and, and, and to try and, and do some good, really. Uh, Problem was, uh, once you get onto the board, you realise there's an inner sanctum of trustees, and the outer ones. Well, they kept us the, what we call user trustees on the outside, really, right? Well, they'd they'd have us on certain committees, but um, that opened my eyes big time because we had one particular trustee, and I think it's been I, I don't know if it came up in somebody's evidence, but 
people would send in photographs of, of, of um, uh, rotten windows, for instance, you know, just to show that the damage was there and they needed a, a grant. And yes, of course, you, you, you'd say yes to it, but there'd be one there. He, he would see a, a PlayStation, say, and a box of fags, cigarettes, and, and um, he said, well, if you can afford smoke, if you can afford that, that's a no from me. <laughs> And you know, it, I don't know if I'm allowed to say his name, but he, he yeah. Um, Perhaps if you tell us his name yeah, after your evidence. Yes, I will. Yeah, but um, that was what you're up against. Um, I'm, I'm not saying all the trustees were like that; they weren't. But this particular one was, and uh, it was uh, trying to get changes. There was like trying to nail jelly to a wall, basically. It, it was, you, could, you know, um, it was an organisation that was set up really just to give the, the, the government peace of mind. They thought they'd done something for us. They thought it was a short-term problem because we'd all be dead, so they'd done a short-term, what they done a short-term solution, except we all lived longer and they didn't really know how to deal with us. And, and so they had these piecemeal things like, and it, nobody should have to write in anyway and beg for money, but I just thought if I could join this organisation and try and change it, well, that was quite naive of me really. Uh, I couldn't change it, really. You've described a number of initiatives um, that were started, setting up a partnership group to facilitate dialogue between the trust and beneficiaries. That's right. Um, there was <coughs> a partnership group we used to meet. There used to be a, <coughs> a bulletin board as well where what just beneficiaries could go on and uh, so they could be themselves. So, you know, they could have... Uh, be anonymous on there, but uh, it was a way to talk to each other about drug treatments, about anything really. I was a pre-runner almost to Facebook, I suppose, but only for those of us infected. And you've also described initiatives about um, weekends for, that were solely for those infected right. who could yep. talk to each other without feeling the constraints of having yeah, family we, around. We had what was called men only weekends. They weren't, they weren't stag dudes, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what, what, what it was, we found that men would open up more when we were with each other rather than with our partners. This is what we found. And so we said, well, I think we need just to have men, with, you know, and that did work because we, we all got together. And that was the only time all of us could be ourselves. And uh, we got a lot out of that because we'd, we'd have um, uh, people to give massages there to, to, to give psychological help we, we just try and put things in place just for the weekend that was a bit of normality you know and uh, yeah um, the McFarland Trust uh, uh, they funded that so that was one of the good things they done however that all stopped um, you want me to come on to that in a minute don't you? It, it just we will come on to that but there were also events for for families and for families partners uh, and for partners for widows for infected there was a, yeah, we, we tried to put a raft of um, weekends so people could meet each other and be themselves and have a little bit of respite from, from the crappy life that you're leading, really. And, and that was. Uh, th th for those two days, you, you were with friends, you were with people that actually understood what you're going through because the only, real, the only people that really understand what I'm talking about now are people that are going through this. I mean, yes... People do give you empathy and sympathy. That's lovely. But we found that when you're talking about your drug regime, when you're talking about uh, things as basic as going to the toilet, how much do it, you know, it's, oh, that sounds silly. But they're the only people that really, really get what you're going through. And, and that was a release. And, and that was good. Uh, that, that was, we needed it. But, you know, and we looked forward to it. But you describe from your perspective as a user trustee, um, um, observing a change in the trust from about 2012, yep. when Roger Evans took over as chair from the previous chair, Christopher Fitzgerald, That's right. yeah. yep. and Jan Barlow took over as chief executive from the previous chief executive, That's right. and Martin Harvey. Yep. Big change. And you're critical in your statement of the direction taken by the McFarland Trust under their leadership. Oh, definitely. Uh, it was a complete change. He, between them, I mean, they got called some pretty awful nicknames. I can't say them here, but um, they, they were, yeah, they weren't seen very favourably by the beneficiaries. And what they'd done was, more or less straight away, they stopped the bulletin board. They cut that out. 
so we couldn't get in touch with each other. Uh, stopped the weekends. Uh, partnership groups stopped. Um, everything stopped. Um, when I said, why are you doing this? This is not what the McFarlane Trust was set up for. We're going to go back to how it should have been originally. Well, how it was originally, it was bloody awful, to be honest. We didn't even have an address for the McFarlane Trust. All they gave us was a, was, was, was a postcode. We didn't even know where their offices were. We didn't know anything about trustees. We didn't know anything about this mysterious organisation. And that all changed. Um, but within months, all them changes went, by the by. Uh, they, no. This is not what the McFarlane Trust was set up for. When we're not going to go down that route, and they stopped all. There was an issue about winter fuel allowance. What can you tell us yeah. about that? Well, um, this is around about the time. I don't know if you, you you remember Osborne kept coming out with all these are all steer times. You know, it was his favourite saying as a chancellor, and Roger Evans picked up on that, and he'd he'd all oh, these the government is in, and I used to say, well, I don't care <laughs> whether the government I said when the government have got money they don't give us any more so don't give me that I said just because the government might be saying these austere times people's health still still needs addressing people's health doesn't get better or worse whether the times are austere or not and he he used to talk down to you and say look um, you don't understand he said we'll be lucky to even get um, what we got last year and we'll be very thankful for it and I said but you're joking I said we can't we, as trustees, we can't carry out our duties. And we had a trustee on there, Russell, Russell Michigan, he, he, the solicitor, and he looked in and he said, we can't, we can't discharge our duties as trustees because we're not getting enough money in. We're, we, we, we're having to turn down uh, requests that we should be uh, meeting, you know, as, as a legal uh, um, stipulation, really. Um, so he... Do you, you want, I'm, well, I'm going to come on to the yeah, to the I, correspondence I for, yeah. um, and, and the issue of, of, about that. <coughs> but um, what was the position specifically in relation to the winter fuel? Allowance? Oh, sorry, I got off track. Don't um, I had a phone call, right? Uh, because this is when the partnership group. This is just after Roger Evans become a, uh, the chair. I had a phone call from him. He said, "Right, you're going to the partnership group." And to me, yeah, yeah. Um, I had to have two hats on, obviously, as a beneficiary and a trustee. But uh, I said, yeah, I'll go. And he said, well, I'm going to propose there. Uh, he said that we can't afford the winter allowance this year. I said, what? He said, no, no. He said, all steer times. He said, these are. He said, the gov we can't expect the government to give us money. I said, but you're talking about people's health. People have to have. The reason why the winter allowance was given in the first place was because People need, you know, you've got HIV, you've got medical problems, you need more heat, you know, hepatitis, HIV, you need more heat in the winter. And um, so that was recognised, and we did. We put in place this winter allowance, and that was £750, and that would be paid at the start of December. OK, if people spend it on, on presents, then fair enough, but that was for the extra bills that people were facing you know, and also, you know, the extra clothes and things like that. So <coughs> that was in place, and that was good. I said, you, as I said, you can't cut it. And I'm, he said, well, I need you to support me on this as a trustee. I said, no way. I said, I'm not supporting you on that at all. And so he said, well, I'm very disappointed in that. That's fair enough. Funny enough, I've got a friend sitting there. He, he was at the same meeting. Unfortunately, he'd found another uh, trustee, up user trustee, up, and um, he did support him. I can't say his name because, you, but um, at the meeting, people were up in arms about it. They said, "But you can't," you know. I think he, what they used to do is float things to see if there's at much opposition. Well, there was opposition, but we had a meeting after that, and he said how disappointed he was in me, and he was still determined to try and cut this. Um, Heat and allowance, or winter allowance, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, what they did in the end, I managed to get compromised. They cut it to five hundred pounds, and you got to remember that Jan Barlow was also chief executive of the Caxton Foundation. At the same, they cut their winter allowance at the same time from five hundred to three hundred fifty, I think it was. So they got their way partly, but I, it was the fact that they were cutting it. You know. Um, 
he'd rather not upset the, the government and not upset the DOH by going for more money. He'd rather the people who, who were ill, who he's supposed to look after, you know, go without heat. And, and that is the sort of person you're talking about, you know. And, and another um, decision or, or disagreement that you describe in your statement was over something that you referred to as discretionary pay. Yeah, discretionary pay. We used to get... Because just after Archer, they gave us a modest increase um, after Archer. Just a modest one, not, not much. But they found that they hadn't given us enough because of some formula they worked out and they didn't work it out properly. So it was agreed. Gillian Merrin was the, was the health minister at the time. She, she agreed that the McFarlane Trust could give this discretionary pay and they would fund it. Um, DOH, this is. To, to just top it up, I think discretionary pay was an extra... Depending on your circumstances, that was up to about £4,000 a year per annum. Um, anyway, that used to increase with inflation each year. Whatever the inflation rate was, that went up by that amount. Well, that year, <laughs> he says, no, we, we, we're not going to give a, an increase for discretionary pass. But, but that would mean that people, I think inflation was about 3 or 4% there. I said, but in real terms, people are going to be 3 or 4% worse off. You can't do that. I said, in fact, they need more. They're on the bread line as it is, you know. He was adamant that wasn't going to go up, and it didn't go up. I fought hard against it. But uh, you got to remember, you know, it was... This was an organisation supposed to be looking after you, looking after all of it, you know, and they wanted to look after the government's money more than look after us. And your perspective, um, in your capacity as, as one of the trustees, a user yep. trustee, was that money was being taken away from beneficiaries, is how you've described yeah. it, Yeah. when there were other ways in which you thought the McFarland Trust could potentially have saved money, saved, yeah. cut down on operating costs well, I, and the I, like. I, well, you... you You've got it in all, all the emails, luckily enough, I kept it. Because I told them, um, you, you're looking at cutting the heating bills or the winter allowance. You're cutting our money each year, and yet you've, they took on two, an operations assistant and somebody on the finance department. And I said, you had an operating loss of over £800,000 last year, and yet you've taken on these two, this is a trustee of Simon, taken on these two extra staff, I said, you're, 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 you're based in probably the most expensive part of London, you know, um, SW1. I said, me and my mate, we went to the Thalidomide Trust to, to see how they managed to attract some government funding. And that was set on an industrial estate in Bedfordshire. Now, that lovely place, but I'm sure they paid a fraction of what the McFarlane Trust were paying. So I put them down, I said, why don't you, A, relocate? Why, why are you taking on these extra staff? Why don't you do as the Haemophilia Society done? And they relocated because they were in Atten Garden, they relocated south of the river and they saved money that way, maybe redundancies. Um, I said, surely you do that, you don't cut money to beneficiaries. But no, that was their mindset. Unfortunately, Jan Barlow, she had previous for this. Uh, <coughs> she was at Fire Brigade Union and she didn't last long there because it's all documented, you'll be able to find this. She was taking on extra staff that they felt they didn't need, and after ten months, she left in mysterious circumstances. And then, hey, lo and behold, we were gifted her at the McFarner Trust. So, uh, and, and I should say, of course, that if we receive <sighs> statements in response to Alan's uh, evidence from Roger Evans or Jan Barlow, those will of course be published on the inquiry yep. website. Um, you and other trustees seem to have become. Um, from your statement, concerned that the Trust was not properly discharging its duties as a charity yeah. and was not being run to the advantage of the beneficiaries. Is that a fair encapsulation right. of your concern? That's right. I mean, if I can just touch on one thing before I forget. Joan Barlow, I'm, I'm going to say this and how she comes back to it, the ladies in here, and uh, we're discussing a widow, right? Uh, a widow who was infected herself. She had a charge on her house. She got her um, she got her MP involved, and in in, in the words of uh, Barlow, uh, he was becoming a nuisance, a big nuisance. And that was she. And she said at a, a meeting, if it was down to me, this woman would get another penny. 
right? And this is a chief executive of a charity, right? I just wanted to say that because uh, that is indicative of, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, how she was. And it'll be interesting how she replies to that. And can I clarify, that was a meeting at which you were present? I was present. Unfortunately, I haven't got email evidence of that, but I heard her say it. Because I said, you're, oh, you're talking about a widow there. Oh, you don't know the trouble that this woman has been, and her MP now, the course. Well, the MP then uh, got up in Parliament and discussed the McFarlane Trust, and he said it wasn't fit for purpose. And so there you go. So the, the concerns that you and some of your fellow trustees had about the direction that the McFarland Trust was yep. taking were, it, were expressed to the Secretary of State for Health, That's right. Alistair Burt MP, yep. and the Charities Commission. That's right, letters were sent. I was, uh, I was a whistleblower by then. Um, I, my MP was, was, was poor, rubbish. I, had a, you know, I, I knew Alistair Burt through, through, um, through a friend. And um, Alistair Burt wasn't my MP, but he took a big interest in this. And I used to pass on the information, what was happening at the time, in the trust, i.e. that it wasn't being run as it should, uh, rightly or wrongly, but I felt that it needed, it, it needed to, 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 to be told. And so did Russell and Elizabeth. Uh, they were both trustees. Elizabeth was even, bless her, she's not here anymore, but um, she was appointed by the DOH. So... Even she was concerned with the way it was being run. So, you know. Um, and one of the um, observations you've made in your statement is that when um, you raised these concerns with the trust, you were told um, that the trust was not here to advocate for that's beneficiaries. Right. Yeah, that's what he said. He said uh, that wasn't the trust role, it wasn't the trust role to ask for the money. They, they put a business, that, as far as he was concerned, they put a business case in each year and they were just fortunate to get anything. As you used to the fall like that, you know, uh, and they used to treat the DOH. Well, it felt like the McFarlane Trust had become a an offshoot of the DOH, to be honest. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to come on to that as well, aren't you? Um, and the he you're talking about is Roger Evans. Yes, the, Roger Evans, yeah. The benefit of clarity. You then described in, in your statement how, in response to these concerns, one of the trustees who you've mentioned, Russell yeah. Mishcon, put together a letter. Yes. Um, um, and the aim of that was for trustees to sign it and send it to the Department of Health, saying that more money was required yeah, in order for the trust to discharge its duties. We needed more money. We couldn't... You couldn't operate properly. I mean, it was awful. I mean, it was getting to the stage where... Roger Evans was telling the NSSC what I was sitting on. Right, you're going to have to, you know, they, you're going to have to manage the expectations. I think the word he said of, of the beneficiaries, but, but and, and and the money you, you, you're dishing out is too much, basically. And uh, we were putting in impossible because Russell sat on it, and Elizabeth for chair of the NSSC, uh, NSSCC, and it looked to the outside as if we were heartless bastards, basically. But we were getting orders that you know you, you that you couldn't help these people that needed help and and that just wasn't right and it just wasn't I mean it's charity shouldn't have been there in the first place don't get me wrong but it just wasn't fulfilling its role as a as a I mean it's a charity only in name only to be honest I mean they didn't go out shaking tins or parachute jumps I mean the money all the money they got came from the government so really it was just it was the it was their plaything, if you like, just to keep us quiet, give us a bit of money, and that's what they did for years, you know. But it wasn't a charity, not not in the true sense of the word. And what was the response of Roger Evans and Jan Barlow to this proposal um, from Russell Mishcon to have this trustee letter to the Department of Health? Well, he brought it up at a trustee meeting. That was um, I can't remember which one it was. Anyway, he brought it up, and that he was angry. Uh, there was a, a very they had a. A set to uh, an argument, I didn't a fight, but an argument. And he said he wouldn't accept the letter, he wouldn't send the letter. And if it was sent on McFarlane Trust headed paper, he'd, he'd look into it legally, he wouldn't have a bar of it, nor would Jan Barlow. So Russell, William Russell, then tried to get the opinion of the other trustees privately, and some supported it. But some didn't, and one or two, there were, 
unbelievable that as a user trust a user trustee who it was a beneficiary didn't support sending the letter and I can't name him but um, I just found one of, I, it was difficult it was uh, it was what was needed they needed to be sent to DOH the DOH needed to be told that the money they were giving us was nowhere near enough but Roger Evans thought that was that would antagonise them. It would probably end his words where they'd probably give us less money. I thought, well, <laughs> this is ridiculous, you know. Anyway, I didn't get sent. In in your statement, you've um, identified some of the reasoning provided by Roger Evans for not sending this letter as follows. And I just wanted to go through these and, and see whether they are, as far as you remember, verbatim quotes of what he said. Yep, yep. The money is simply not there. That's right. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's right. We are not prepared to rock the boat. That's right. Let's not forget the DOH set up the MFT and can close it down. That's right, yep. There's only one winner if you pick a fight with the government. Yep, these are all document, yeah, stuff he said. That's uh, his mindset. And you've also described in your statement Mr Evans saying that the MFT was really there to largely process funds. That's right. Uh, and you've also said he described the MFT as the arm of the government, whether you like it or not. That's right. There's just one letter we'll look at. You've provided yes. the inquiry with lots yeah, that will be... I know. <laughs> no, don't worry. No need to apologise. And those will be fully investigated and explored with the appropriate individuals in due course. Yep. But there's just one letter to put up now. 1122016. Sorry, it's an email. And it's an email dated the 26th of January 2013 from uh, Roger Evans, and it was sent to all the trustees, including yourself. Yeah. A subject minister letter. Dear trustee, in case you're still considering whether to send an individual trustee letter to DH, I want to clarify a few factual points with you before you decide. I note that several trustees are not prepared to sign such a letter. I agree with their rationale for not being prepared to do so. Several of you have asked me what influence DH has over the McFarlane Trust. The answer is a lot. The government through DH set up MFT in the first place and could close us down at any time if they so wished. DH appoints three of our nine trustees and they are our sole source of funding. The relationship is bound up in a trust deed and an amended version was agreed unanimously by our board a year ago. A DH appointed trustee challenging DH in the proposed way would raise a number of questions within DH about loyalty, for instance. Uh, and then he goes on to say that a decision hasn't yet been announced by the Department of Health on funding. We'll continue to chase them vigorously and draw their attention to the repercussions of the long delay. As I said at the board meeting on Monday, I know the way central government works. I suspect DH has already made a recommendation to the ministers on our funding and the reserves. This will not be an isolated decision and will be incorporated in a much bigger one of the entire healthcare spending programme for 2013-14, totaling billions of pounds. Uh, and then uh, the information Jan gave us on Monday of her induction meeting with DH was very helpful, but it was not new to you. It was identical to the information I've given you and beneficiaries for some months. I very much doubt that a letter from several individual trustees or from the board either will influence whatever recommendation they've made. What it will do is antagonise them and badly damage our future working with civil servants who are supportive of MFT. In the future, MFT will have to work with DH. We can't change our relationship, um, I think there's a with missing, with them in the near future, particularly as most of us have signed the trust slash DH deed. Antagonism will not make for a meaningful, productive relationship. They will not want to work with trustees who've been hostile to them in this way. It risks future years funding allocations and will jeopardise discussions on other issues. For instance, the charitable relationship between DH and MFT and the meaning of charitable need have been raised by you recently. I agree that we should, we should open a dialogue with DH on these when funding is known. I would be surprised if DH will be prepared to do so involving trustees who are hostile to them. In an email to me, Russell advocates taking the battle to DH. I don't recognise a battle in this context. DH have not started a fight with MFT and it would be very unwise for a group of individual trustees to pick a fight with DH and central government. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. Mm -hmm. There you go. <clears throat> says it all. That's what we're up with. <coughs> Can I just come back to the, the top of that letter? Thank you. Uh, the third paragraph, um, the last sentence, 
the Department of Health appointed trustee challenging DH in the proposed way would raise a number of questions within DH about loyalty, for instance. Do I take it that th there was a, at least one of the Department of Health appointed trustees who wished to, uh, I in the words of Mr Mishcon, take the battle to the DH? Yes, yes there was, yeah. Elizabeth, bless her. She's not here now. So the, the author um, here was taking on board the, the battles of the DH. Yeah. I see. Yes, that's how he, he, he saw himself as part of the DH, I think, to be honest. Well, it, it, it's, it's open to that inference. Yes, yeah, yeah. But that was your perspective based yeah. upon your involvement it and was. dealings with the uh, McFarlane Trust. Yes, yeah. Um, that was, yeah, in, in the end, I think you're going to come on to this in a minute. He, he, I, I became such an irritation to him that he asked me to resign in the end. We're going to look at your resignation okay. letter. Um, it's 1122017, please. Sorry, sir, have you finished with yes, that? Sorry. Yes. So we can see that by January 2015, you have given um, notice that you are going to resign. Yeah. I'm giving notice that I'm resigning my position as trustee of the McFarland Trust with immediate effect. My reasons are, having just read the minutes of MFT board meeting, I was struck with the blatant hypocrisy from Chair Roger Evans with item 72414, Chairman's report as follows. And then you quote from those minutes, as I understand it, which said, it was unanimously agreed that Roger Evans would write to Alan Burgess on behalf of the board to wish him well because he'd been unable to attend the recent board meetings due to ill health. Trustees hope he will be able to attend the January 2015 meeting so he could be thanked for all he's done during his time as trustee. This meeting was October 27, 2014. On September the 15th, 2014, barely six weeks before the meeting, I received an email from Roger Evans containing the following quote. I think we have reached a point where it is doubtful whether you're continuing as trustee until the end of your period of office is helpful or welcome. I doubt whether you or I can work productively together in the coming months given your latest correspondence. And then you say this, the above quote was in response was in response of myself and my role as trustee discussing how the trust was run. Unfortunately, my views did not coincide with those of the chair. As I stated, I find the hypocrisy quite frankly staggering, and this is the final straw for me with this chair, whom I've had issues with his running of the MFT in the past. Consequently, I have no confidence in either the chair or the chief executive, Jan Barlow, to run the MFT in a fit and proper way to benefit beneficiaries and not the DOH. The McFarlane Trust, in general, may like to reflect on the result of the APPG survey, which shows a minority of beneficiaries were happy with the Trust. I would just like to quote a passage from the survey. A great deal of McFarlane Trust recipients were of the view that the organisation was getting worse, its staff becoming more distant, and it is becoming harder to access assistance. With that fact in mind, perhaps it would be a good idea for the Chair and Chief Executive to consider the ill feeling towards the Trust that initiated the survey in the first place. After six years as a trustee, it saddens me to see the McFarlane Trust in a worse state than when I joined. Yep. And you ceased at that point to be a trustee right. of the McFarlane yep. Trust. That's right. You, um, uh, not long, I think, before that, had become a trustee of the Haemophilia Society right. or on the board of the Haemophilia yep. Society. Yeah, You've drawn a contrast in your statement between the McFarlane Trust, which you describe as unwilling to make reductions in operational costs, and the Haemophilia Society, which was willing to yeah. try and make those reductions. Yeah, they had to. I mean, they would have gone out as it, 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 existence if they had. Now, you've then described a meeting of, of trustees within the Haemophilia Society, at which it was reported by the Chief Executive, Ms Carroll, yeah. um, that something had been said to her by Jan Barlow in a recent meeting. That's right, yeah. Um, what, what can you recall about that? Uh, well, <laughs> board meetings are uh, not the most lively of places to be, and, and you spend most of your time navel gazing, to be honest. And, and some of the subjects are pretty mundane and whatever, but um, it was at the point where Liz Cowell said uh, she, she had this meeting with Roger Evans and Jan Barlow, and she came out with a quote that she said Jan Barlow said. Now, I'd like to read it out in its entirety, if I may. Um, 
Right, Liz Carroll was in a meeting with Roger Evans, chair of MFT, and Jan Barlow, CEO of MFT. Jan Barlow stated, and this is a quote from the minutes, Department of Health should wait as long as possible before making a decision as more people have died and there will be less people to pay and fight for payment. Well, just have a look at the minutes of that meeting. Yeah. And I said, yeah. then, I said, whoa, whoa, could you repeat that? She repeated it. And I said, I want that put in the minutes, please. I said, that has to go in the minutes. And it was, but carry. Yeah. And Henry, can we have 1122015? Can we have the version which just has the three relevant pages, please? First of all, page one. So we can see minutes of a board of trustees meeting held at the Haemophilia Society on the 4th of February 2015, and we see it amongst those present yourself. Yep. Can we then go to page four, please, Henry? And if we pick it up halfway down the page, we, say, we see meeting with the McFarlane Trust. LC, that's Ms Carroll the, of the Haemophilia Society, met with Jan Barlow, CEO, and Roger Evans, chair of the McFarlane Trust, MFT, there were two main areas Jan and Roger wanted to discuss. And then the first is about the Haemophilia Society's nomination of McFarlane Trust MPs. The second is then this, the Haemophilia Society response to the recent APPG inquiry report and upcoming Penrose report. Um, and there's a discussion um, about that. And then if we pick it up at the bottom of the page, it says this in the minutes. The possible implications of the Penrose report were then discussed and Elsie stated that this will have an impact UK-wide and might bring things to a head early into the new parliament. The Haemophilia Society would keep the pressure on whoever is in government to make an announcement as quickly as possible. Jan then expressed her opinion that the DH should wait for as long as possible before making any decision as more people will have died and there will be less people to pay and fight for payment. Elsie did not comment on this point. Um, we can, we can uh, put that away, thanks, Henry. So you obviously were not present at the meeting between no. Ms Carroll and Ms Barlow and Mr Evans. You can only report on what you were told at the Haemophilia Society meeting by Ms Carroll yep. uh, in the way you've described. Yep. Your statement suggests that you asked Ms Carroll to report this to Alistair Burt. Yes, yeah. And that was done. Yep. And the, um, there was a letter which repeated um, or, or set out the, the allegation that Ms Barlow had made this statement. Yes. The response your statement describes of the McFarlane Trust, first of all, was to deny firmly that this statement had been made. And I should make that clear. We don't know what Ms Barlow would say now no. yet. Yep. But we do know that at the time it was firmly denied. And then there was a threat by the McFarlane Trust to sue the Haemophilia Society and Ms Carroll for defamation. That's right. You wanted the Haemophilia Society to fight this, yeah. if necessary, in court. Yeah, yeah. Um, but your statement describes that the chair, the then chair of the Haemophilia Society, decided that the Haemophilia Society and Ms Carroll would retract what the statement and apologise. It was apologize. a unilateral decision from Bernard Manson. I mean, I managed to, I don't know how I managed it, but I managed to get the majority of the board to, to agree that we needed... I day in court. I said, I said, this is manna from heaven, really. I said, uh, if we, let them take us to court. I said, let the world see what an awful organisation the Mac Trust is. And uh, naively, perhaps, I said, if that's the truth, that's the truth, that, you know, truth will out, you know, because uh, I'm a great believer, you tell the truth, everything will be fine. But um, Bernard Manson, unfortunately, thought different, and he went above the board and ordered his carol to retract it and issue a statement and basically grovel, um, which is what they've done. And I was angry because I thought um, <laughs> we should have seen this through because the papers would have absolutely loved this and it would have shown everybody, you know, what an awful organisation, what an awful couple there, there was in, in, you know, uh, in charge of this so-called charity. But no, it, it, it happened and I was angry as well because believe it or not there, there was a trustee 
that sat on the the Haemophilia Society board and also was a trustee of the McFarlane Trust. And uh, this particular trustee, uh, he was the blue-eyed boy of, of, of the Haemophilia Society anyway, but um, I said, what is his role in all this? Because I didn't get an answer. And uh, I was, I said, I can't believe a trustee... <laughs> That sounds ridiculous, but a trustee of the, of the McFarlane Trust was also a trustee of the Haemophilia Society, but they wanted to close it down. And I said, but that can't be right. It's conflict of interest. You can't have him on the board. I can't sit with him on the board. So he said, well, cheerio. Then. And, uh, <laughs> so they'd rather, I could not not believe that they'd rather have him sitting on the board who wanted to take the Haemophilia Society to court. But that's why I resigned in the end. I had to. And so you stepped down from the Haemophilia yeah. Society because of this issue and yeah. the response to it and the, and the yeah. particular um, conflict you perceived a fellow trustee yeah, having I, had. Yeah, I thought they should have stood up for the beneficiaries. I thought that's what the Haemophilia Society really should be all about because you've got to remember we're, we're all haemophiliacs and also obviously uh, wives or partners were, who were infected, you know, all basically... It was through haemophilia, really, to you know the treatment for haemophilia. So the Haemophilia Society should have supported Liz, and they should have really supported the beneficiaries because, in an indirect way, they would have been because this would have been out in the public. This would have been aired, and these people would have known what these two individuals uh, were up to, or what they were like. And the way you've put it in your statement is this: that the, the chair, Bernard Manson went overboard, I think you mean over the board. Over the board, yeah. And capitulated yeah. to the demands of the collective boards of the MFT and the legal advice. Liz Carroll was forced to not only give a public apology, but to deny that Jan Barlow had ever said what she did. Yeah. And just pausing there, I should make absolutely clear that we will, of course, be inviting the Haemophilia Society and Ms Carroll to set out whatever they wish to in response to that and to comment on the appropriate documents, be interesting. some of which you've provided yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, but that led to your stepping down in any event from the Haemophilia Society. Yeah. Um, you have in your statement included some more general observations or criticisms of the Haemophilia Society, and I just wanted to ask you, if, if, if I may, what you meant by them, if you can. You say um, uh, in your um, witness statement this, the Haemophilia Society never really wanted to face up to the contaminated Factor Eight tragedy. They gave Birchgrove money to advocate on our behalf, but we were very much treated like the bastard at the family reunion, and we were seen as an unfortunate episode in our history. Now, again, the Haemophilia Society may wish to say something very different about that, but well, what's me, your perspective? What is it that leads you to reach well, because, those views? Um, because what happened to us uh, was, was, was a, I think, they... They looked upon it at the time as a, as a dark episode in, 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 in their history because I'd found a copy of the bullet and I gave it actually to, to Colin Solicitors. They've still got it, but I forget when it was. But in it, they, they were, um, it was 1983, 84, I can't remember when, but uh, they were still, it was a, an eminent doctor in there, still, I think 11 haemophiliacs had died in America. And he said, this was in, you've got to remember the bulletin used to be the Bible for a lot of mothers or whatever. They'd read this and think, oh, everything's fine. Um, he said people should go on being treated with Factor Eight, even though 11 haemophiliacs had died in America. He thought the benefits outweighed the risks. And he, he, he said he couldn't see a problem. Well, I thought that was irresponsible of the Haemophilia Society to, to print that in in. in, in uh, bullet and because people would have carried on treating and he, 11 haemophiliacs was 11 too many they should have then thought well, bloody, you know this is bad we stop it all together issued a, a warning to everybody but no I, I think they were too cosy with a lot of the pharmaceutical companies who obviously gave a lot of us I mean BPL were, were British but a lot of the pharmaceutical companies were sponsoring certain haemophilia society events and things like that, so they were too close. Um, so they, they tended to, we were a little bit of an embarrassment to them, and they didn't really, I mean, they got money from the government for AIDS um, help, I suppose, but the Birch Grove was set up, so they gave the Birch Grove the money to 
basically look after the people they should have been really looking after. But there, there wasn't any advice, there wasn't any counselling, there wasn't anything really, you know, forthwith from, from the haemophilic. All That all came from Birch Cove. We used to have weekends, you know, people could meet and... But, but you got nothing from the Haemophilic Society, is what I was trying to say. And w there was a particular uh, chief executive there who really kept us at arm's length. Uh, I don't know. Um, the last topic I wanted to ask you about was just a, a little about your campaigning activities and um, 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 one of the meetings you had and, and some steps you took after that. Y you have, over the years, undertaken a lot of different activities. You've visited Parliament to meet with MPs and ministers... Um, you gave evidence to Archer. Yeah. You have written a lot of letters over the years uh, to prime ministers and others. Um, you described in your statement a particular meeting you had with David Cameron whilst he was prime minister yeah. and Jane Ellison, who was a minister within the Department of Health, I think. That's right, yeah, she was. What can you tell us about that meeting? Well, I was lucky enough, along with uh, uh, another beneficiary, and uh, along with uh, um, Alistair Burt, to be invited to see David Cameron at number 10 and discuss um, the contaminated blood issue, you know. And um, so, yeah, I thought, great. Be able to go to him and we might eventually get something done, you know. Um, so we went along, we met him, there was Jane Allison there, there was civil servants, and what have you. And I gave a statement to him, you know, regarding my life and everything, and he was quite moved, and so was Jane Allison. And he told us, you know, uh, the contaminated blood issue, Bloody Sunday, Hillsborough, they, they were all issues he wanted to, 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 to address, you know. Um, he, he, he thought that, uh, that these issues should be addressed and he wanted to help us. Um, and I just, I said to him at the end, y you can't give me health back. I said, but you can give me financial dignity. And if you can do that, that that will be something, you know. And he said, "Well, I'm sure that that's something we're going to look into, and we're going to try and help." You know, um, he didn't promise anything. He didn't say, "You, I'll stop the Mac Trust, and you'll get compensation or something." But he didn't say that. But he just said he'd help. And I walked down the road with Jane Allison afterwards because she was quite moved, um, and she wanted to know more. So I did. I walked down the road with her, and then. Uh, about three, four months later, um, yeah, they helped, all right. <laughs> Didn't help us. It came out there was going to be a consultation, and in this consultation, the DOH were looking at taking money off us. And I thought, what? We would have been uh, probably around about four or five thousand pounds worse off if if these implications in this consultation had come about and consultations normally mean this is what we're going to do but it looks as though we've consulted with you but this is what we're going to do so there was a lot of people protested in this room you know letters were written and protests were made and I I said to Alistair I said this, he, he said uh, he said I don't know how, how this has come about really he, he said this is I think this is shocking and it, it wasn't anything he'd done, but unfortunately it was Jane Ellison. She didn't. I thought he got it, but he didn't get it, you know. So uh, nor did she. And I said to me mate, who, who knew journalists, I said we've got to get this in the press. He managed to get it into Private Eye. That went into Private Eye. I said that's all. Right. I said Private Eye is not. It's not read by the general population, really. I said we need something. That, 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 so he knew a freelance journalist. And then we told the story to her, and she said, I've got the Sunday Mirror. They're, they're, they're very interested. However, um, they need a face to it. I was anonymous at the time. You know, I, I wasn't public. Um, so I discussed it with my family. I said, look, what do you think? I said, yeah, go for it. Um, so I did. I had to... I had to come out, you know. I, I a picture of me in the paper, um, and um, report had done a YouTube video of me, and, and that went. That's on YouTube now. And um, um, I came out, and, and we, the only thing we lost, believe it or not, was a window cleaner for it. And I will explain that. Is uh, 
<laughs> um, Denise does my drugs. She puts it in the dosset boxes, and she has them all on the table or whatever in the kitchen. And he was cleaning the windows, and uh, he came in for some water. And he said, well, bloody hell, he said, somebody's ill. And uh, she thought, I'll shut it, I'll tell him. Um, because Alan's going in the paper, you know. So he told him, never came, cleaned the windows again, but he goes to the neighbours. So <laughs> we, we, we lost the window cleaning, but that was bad. And the particular decision you had taken in response to what you understood was a, was a, a threat to or a risk of the, such financial support as there was being cut, yes. was to go on a treatment strike. That's what I said, and that's how we got in the paper, because... Um, I didn't know, we didn't know what to do, because if I had to cut the money, we, we, it would have been, we, we were on precious little as it was, and it could have came down to, you know, the house having to be sold and downsizing, and it was nip and tuck, you know, money-wise anyway, and, and to do that, and also after I've been to see him, and after I shook his hand, and after he said he'd help, and I felt betrayed again. I mean, we've been betrayed over the years by many politicians, many, many politicians uh, of all colours, right? Blue, red, yellow. I mean, Norman Lamb shook my hand once and, and said, he said, oh, you're in our manifesto, we'll help you. Um, don't forget that. And I said, well, you, you probably won't get in. He said, well, you are, you're in our manifesto, so we will help. Well, he got in, didn't he? Us and the students, they dropped like a hot potato, didn't want to know. So we have been lied to over the years, so we used to being lied to. And, but I just thought it was one lie too many, really. And uh, there you go. And so I said, look, I'm going to have to do something drastic. Sarah wasn't happy. I said, but well, it might not come, I'm hoping it don't come down to it, but what can I do? You know, because I'm not having it. And so I did. And that is why the paper got interested, because... And we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just look at... The newspaper article briefly, and yep. then we'll look at the video yep. interview that you uh, did with them. Um, could we have Henry 1122014? We can just see it here. Dad infected with HIV after NHS tainted blood scandal slams cruel Tory payments cuts for victims. Mm. Uh, and it describes you as um, vowing to stop taking life-saving medication over planned Tory cuts that will leave victims up to £7,000 a year yeah. worse off. Um, it refers to uh, your... Uh, adding to your fury the news that victims of the blood scandal in Scotland were to receive new uh, annual payments... And you say this, we feel betrayed, I can't believe I'm having to resort to a treatment strike, but I'm prepared to die for this. Mm. What else can we do to get their attention? Didn't want to, obviously, but I <laughs> just felt enough was enough, really. That was, as I said, one betrayal too many, one lie too many. And we're just going to play the video because, as you said, up until this point, you had effectively been anonymous you'd kept your infection to yourself and to your family members yep. um the fellow campaigners yep. knew members of the birch grove group people on the mcfarland trust but not the public at large no, no. um uh, and so it was a big step for you yep. to be in the sunday mirror and to yeah, give an interview massive, massive step massive step henry are we able to play the video My name is Alan Burgess, uh, I'm a haemophiliac and unfortunately I contracted HIV and Hepatitis C through contaminated Factor 8 which I need to stop the bleeding that, uh, because I'm missing that factor in my blood. A lot of the, a lot of the haemophiliacs, 4,000 altogether, 4,500 I think, received HIV, Hepatitis C or both. I was one of the 1,243 that received both. Out of the 1,243, there's only 263 of us still alive, which has obviously led to plenty of widows, loads of dependent children and now classed as orphans. And it's unfortunate that 30 years later I find myself in this position because I thought by now the government would have done the right and proper thing and gave us some sort of financial dignity by now. But unfortunately, 
they haven't, although in other countries they have, Ireland for example, and up in Scotland they've just announced that they are looking after their contaminated blood victims, even going so far as to have a memorial garden. Now this government, on the other hand, has come out with a consultation two or three months ago that actually sets out to take money off me and my wife. If the money goes, um, I don't know what we'll do. Um, we were hoping f that the fact that I met David Cameron in number 10 and I explained my situation to him, explained how many drugs I have to take a day, I have to take drugs just to stay alive. The effect this had on me, the side effects, the effect this had on the family, on my daughter, on my wife. He got it, I thought he got it, but obviously he hadn't. Because now he's saying that he wants to take money off me and not actually look after me, which is all I said to him at the end. I said, you can't give me back my health, but you can give me back my financial dignity. And he said he'd look into it and he promised me that along with Bloody Sunday in Hillsborough, the contaminated blood tragedy was something on his list that he wanted to sort out. You didn't in fact go ahead with the treatment strike because the particular proposals um, right. that have concerned you. Yeah, luckily enough. Uh, whether that hadn't, I'm not saying that, but they dropped them in the end and the job is it. Um, Alan, I just wants to finally ask you about something that you put in one of your statements. You said this, I am 61 years old now and I was diagnosed when I was 27. Yeah. This is not over. The pain and trauma has been ongoing for all these years, compounded by the government's approach. It was alluded that I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, but there is nothing post about it because it is ongoing. Each story is a tragic story and no one size fits all. No. Everybody in here has got an awful story to tell. Mine's just one of many, basically. Alan, those are the questions I have for you. I'm just going to ask Mr Snowden if he's got any further questions for you or for Sarah. There are none. Thank you, Jenny. I think there's something that both of you want to say. I don't know which of you wants to go first. For the past 28 years, and who knows how many more, not a day has gone by that I haven't worried about my dad. From age 11, when I would cry myself to sleep, to the present day, when sleep becomes a luxury, the main thing which preoccupies my mind is him, my dad, my hero, my world. I watched my successful father lose his business due to ill health and scrape for every penny he and my mum could find, just to keep our family going. I watched him go in and come out of hospital on too many occasions and was always wondering if this is it. Is this the day we lose him? And this is still with me today. The wondering, the fear, the panic of, is this it now? As I've grown older and witnessed more and more suffering, it has affected my mental health too. I have to take antidepressants for help with depression and anxiety and I'm currently signed off work as a result of this. At no point have I ever been offered any form of help with this by way of counselling and such from any organisation. There needs to be something in place for the affected and infected to be given help. A place where those like me can call upon an expert who knows our stories and is available to support us whenever we need it. What we need to understand too is that this scandal has gone beyond second generation, but now to third generation. My 13-year-old eldest daughter has also been profoundly affected by this travesty. She finds it very difficult to come to terms with her granddad's illness. And leading on to very recent events, due to the inquiry, I found it necessary to tell my 11-year-old daughter about her grandfather and what has led to this inquiry. Talk about out of the mouths of babes, when I had finished telling her of the whys and wherefores of this tragedy, she wiped away her tears and said, will someone go to prison for this? <clears throat> to lose a loved one is the hardest thing anybody will ever go through. 
However, to have a father going through incredible illness with only one end in sight, I cannot help but feel like we're living a life sentence. The never-ending roller coaster of emotional and psychological torture of his ups and downs that we are still going through today is debilitating, and the feelings of uncertainty, anguish and fear for a man who is loved so extremely is always at the forefront of my mind. Having my dad still with us comes with another set of emotions too, guilt being one. Crazy as it sounds, I feel guilty that I still have my dad here with us when I know so when I know the vast majority within our community do not. I am part of a group who have been named the fatherless generation, and that alone makes me feel torn. I have a sense of belonging to the group with all their support and camaraderie, but I also feel that I'm intruding as yes, dad is still here on this earth. However, I lost my dad 28 years ago. He is not the same man he would have been without having been infected. I see a man who struggles daily with the most everyday physical tasks. I see a man who was to put on an act of everything's okay when he is suffering psychologically. I see a man who is the shadow of a dad I once had. This life we have been given has torn my family apart. We have gone through things no normal family ever would or should. I want the government and the pharmaceutical companies responsible for this nightmare to be held to account. We all need to know why on earth this was ever allowed to happen and I want them punished. Both the infected and affected need closure and we need a full compensation scheme in line with or similar to the Republic of Ireland. I have campaigned alongside my dad for justice for all those infected haemophiliacs and affected families and have seen him diminish from a man with hunger for answers and a passion for the cause to a man who is weary and losing all hope. <coughs> We have such limited time now that the importance and urgency of finding answers and finally having our day could not be more paramount. Right. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to give some thanks to people. Um, I'd like to thank the Collins team uh, for having faith in us when no other solicitor would touch us with a barge pole. They've been fantastic. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sarah, my daughter Laura, Mark, and of course my wife. Um, thanks to all of you. Anyway, an earlier witness, Mark, he quoted the line from a Queen song. I've paid my dues time after time. I've done my sentence but committed no crime. Well, I've not finished my sentence yet, death will finish that for me. However, I wish I had committed a crime, as in prison I would have received all the psychiatric and counselling help I have needed throughout the years. You have heard Sir Brian from spouses, parents, children, and carers, widows of those of us still living this nightmare, who are both infected and affected. We are in extreme need of help. We all have one thing in common, the fact that the majority of us I've had to endure this with no psychiatric or counselling help at all. Unless you were prepared to beg and jump through hoops and go cap in hand to the so-called charities and their IBIS. If help was then offered, it was only piecemeal. And as Tony pointed out, this help was not even offered to bereaved children of those who have passed away. To cast our community aside and to be largely forgotten about is something continuous governments have excelled at. They've failed to ensure that those of us damaged by this disaster, outrage, tragedy, call it what you like, have all had to endure and we're still living with getting zero government-sponsored psychiatric or counselling help. And this is nothing short of scandalous. Successive governments have much to answer for, but this omission, they should hang their heads in shame. The inquiry acknowledges the importance of mental well-being for those giving evidence or attending the hero, he, he, hearings by offering confidential psychological help and support that's provided by the Red Cross. However, once the inquiry dates finish, we are then left to cope with this nightmare on our own yet again, as the government 
is fund an inquiry. They obviously recognise the psychological help we need during this, so how can they explain the complete lack of help and understanding when the inquiry concludes? Two weeks ago at this inquiry, I met Christina Burgess. She's no relation who I knew from my time as a trustee at the Haemophilia Society. Christina has set up an organisation called Haemophilia and Bleeding Disorders Counselling Association. And they've got trained counsellors and psychotherapists. They want to give help where needed and understand that ongoing psychological help will be financially out of our reach for most of us. So they're trying to attract funding for this worthwhile and important project, but are not meeting with much success. When the McFarlane Trust was wound up last year, we were baffled. And without consultation from any of the beneficiaries, the remaining money that MFT held was transferred to the Terence Higgins Trust. Estimates of that money ranged from three quarters of a million to one million pounds. That money was paid by the DOH to the McFarlane Trust to help beneficiaries and their families. So Brian, I can't think of another organisation that wants to help us as the HBDCA wants to but lack of funding will not allow. And I cannot think of a better use for this money that MFT mysteriously gifted the THT. That money should now be released and used for the way it was intended, to give much, need much needed mental and psychological help to our community. Now to come on to my personal thoughts about this tragedy. I was one of 4,670 British haemophiliacs infected with hepatitis C. I was also one of the 1,243 also infected with HIV AIDS. As a result, around 2,500 have since died, with scores more needing organ transplants and dialysis, and some victims have inadvertently infected their partners. Imagine the outcry if these numbers of deaths in our community were killed off in a one-off disaster, but instead these people have slipped away quietly, one by one, over the years forgotten victims of a silent and avoidable tragedy. Yet even after these deaths, families have received no counselling, no apology, and any questions they have have likely gone unanswered. That nobody has been held to account for this tragedy is nothing short of scandalous, and something I hope this inquiry addresses. In, in France and Japan, people have been sent to jail for their role in this scandal. In Canada, the Red Cross was prosecuted for neg negligence. In those countries, as well as Britain, commercial interests were put ahead of safety. But in Great Britain, no liability has been omitted. And what makes our successive government's attitude to this saga so shameful is not just the shortcuts, greed and incompetence that led to the tragedy, it's the cover-ups, the heartlessness of the successive governments that have refused to admit their failings time after time again. And time after time they've rejected pleas from suffering families. The role of the DOH can be summed up in a memo that was released a little while ago from the early days. It says, and I quote, of course the maintenance of the life of a haemophiliac is itself expensive and I'm very much afraid that those already doomed will generate savings which will more than cover the cost of testing blood donations. This was from the DOH years ago. Unbelievable. An example of the contempt shown to us over the years. Because of this scandal and tragedy, I've not lost own, I've, I have not only lost my business and livelihood, but my sex life, both my financial dignity and my dignity as a man, feeling totally emasculated. I've also lost over half my life as I was 27 years old when I was diagnosed and received a letter advising me of my infection of HIV. I've lost many friends from this community. I nearly lost my marriage, my rock, who's my wife, and at times I've lost my mind and even my will to live. We must have answers as to why this disaster was allowed to happen, and we must be offered full and proper compensation, and no more piecemeal payments to keep us quiet. This scandal has dragged on too long, there have been too many deaths, too much pain, too much grief and too many betrayals. This government must admit its failures and accept that it's let down this community in the most tragic way possible. And then, and only then, it may bring some peace to the thousands of us caught up in this horrific tragedy. That's it. Thank you. Can I, can I thank 
you first, uh, Alan. Yeah. Um, and can I thank you first of all, uh, and perhaps least of all, uh, for sending me a video, oh. uh, which which I got this morning. Yeah. Those who are core participants should know. Uh, it was a video about the Birch Grove Memorial Grove. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it was part of the inquiry's um, material. Yeah. So thank you for that. You're welcome. But thank you, more importantly, uh, for uh, your evidence of the struggles which you have had, struggles uh, with uh, your infection, struggles uh, with your financial dignity, struggles uh, with your desire to ensure that those who are victims uh, are put first when it comes to those bodies that deal with them, uh, and above all, uh, struggles with your own mental difficulties. Uh, it was, I, I think, uh, I forget whether it was Ms. Richards' words or yours to say it was a massive step to give your interview uh, in the uh, earlier part of the millennium to the, uh, the mirror. Uh, if that was a massive step for a two-and-a-half-minute video, uh, then to be on stage, as it were, for a whole morning, telling the, the world of your most intimate difficulties uh, and of your struggles is beyond massive. Thank you. Uh, and you deserve our sincere thanks for something I know uh, that you were nervous about. Yeah. But if I may comment... Uh, on one of your comments that you felt emasculated as a man. In the way which I think, from what you've said, you see it, uh, I think you fronted up you. to uh, all your struggles you. before us. You. To you, um, Sarah, you broke down, uh, we've heard, in front of Archer. Well, you haven't done that today, but it's been a full exploration of everything that you and your family have suffered. And you've shown us how one, it, one um, blood transfusion has so many ripples and after effects in so many different ways, it, destroying, as you put it, your family life, although you are here as testament to resilience and perhaps uh, overcoming some of the struggles. Thank you very much for what must have been remarkably difficult evidence to give. Uh, and indeed, for each of you to listen to the other uh, and to your sister. So, thank you very much, both. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Brian. Thank you, Sir Brian. Mm. Thanks for having me. Well, that was so interesting, I suspect no one will have realized that they have missed their morning coffee break. Um, we will take lunch now. Uh, we'll start again to hear the uh, rest of the, today's evidence, and we'll go on uh, as we do until we finish. But we will start again at 5 to 2. So 5 to 2. <laughs>